Uh, members, um, can, can you hear me, um, those who are on Starleaf? Yes, okay. indeed, I am. Thank you. Okay. We, were, we were enjoying your chat there, so... <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, we started, wasn't it late? Oh yes, yeah, we knew we heard <laughs> you. We heard, we heard it all. So, um, okay, so welcome, back, welcome back, members. Um, just advise everyone who is here to social distance during the meeting. Um, today we will consider subordinate legislation, departmental briefing um, on monitoring rounds. That's um, including January monitoring round and uh, departmental briefing on the taxi financial assistance scheme. We don't have any apologies, but three members are with us via Starleaf. So we have Dolores Kelly, Andrew Muir and Martina Anderson. Uh, moving then to item two, which is chairman's business. Um, just advise that um, following our last meeting, um, there was obviously a request that I meet, put in a request to meet the minister um, just in relation to... Um, and following the discussion that we had about the cancellation of briefings by the department on monitoring round and also on the financial package and the very difficult situation that taxi drivers were finding themselves in and particularly moving into the Christmas period and the numbers who still had not received um, payment and the associated problems around that. Um, the, the minister met with myself and the deputy chair on the 23rd of December and um, we, had, we had a reasonably good meeting um, where we, um, we were provided with much of the information which is really in your pack today and which we'll be discussing with um, officials just in relation to the numbers and certainly that day um, there was an anticipation that further people would receive payments and there would also then be notification and payment issue in the week issuing in the week between Christmas and the new year. Now, obviously, we're still aware that there are those who have outstanding payments still to be made, and we can explore that with them. Um, we also discussed um, matters pertaining to the taxi operators and also to the coach operators. And again, that will, again, will be discussed a later in, in the meeting. Um, Yesterday, the Deputy Chair and myself um, with, with Cathy um, met with the Minister and the Permanent Secretary um, just via Zoom. And it was really just to get um, an idea of what she was planning to bring forward in the next number of months um, so that we could then look at, at, at forward work planning um, and also then to look ourselves. Now, obviously, we plan to have um, sort of a, a mini strategy afternoon, um, but the nature of what's happened in the last couple of weeks it wasn't going to work for us to do that today and obviously with so many members um, not being able to be in the building so we would like to schedule that probably in the next few weeks on a, on a day that we are going to be in the building um, and to have our meeting in the Senate chamber perhaps then we could break away for an hour or two just to, to focus our minds as to what we want to do ourselves over the next few months um, very mindful of um, where we are with regards to COVID, but also looking towards COVID recovery and what we can do then as a committee um, to work um, alongside the department in some ways and rather than sort of duplicating some of the work they're doing, but sort of add, add a value to that by way of many inquiry or um, really whatever the, the, the committee then decide to do. But so they were two useful meetings that we had. So that's really a, an overview of that. Moving then to our draft minutes, that's at item three, um, page six, for the meeting of the 16th of December. Are members content? That's Please. inaccurate. Good. Moving then to item four, which is matters arising at page 14. Um, again, that's from the meeting of the 16th of December. Members, any concerns or comments <coughs> on, on that? Um, obviously, there was a few bits of correspondence. Um, coming out of, of that meeting. Members, any comments? Content? Okay, at page um, 19, then we have um, outstanding committee requests for information. Um, now, there was an error in that, in that I'm hoping that we're going to get some responses back before the 1st of July. Um, oh, I think <laughs> that was <laughs> around, <laughs> around the wall. My others, maybe some, some might be quite happy with that timeline. Um, members content with that? Yes. Great, yep. Moving then to item five, um, where we have um, correspondence. Um, there's quite a few bits of correspondence there. Um, 
other members have, have read through them all, I'm not sure, but um, there is an outline as to how we're going to deal with that as well in your packs. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of things for you. Um, at page 28, we have the ministerial response to the committee um, just regarding issues that we raised on the 2nd of December. Um, the minister has advised on page 32 of your pack and that she's offered um, the committee a confidential briefing mm. in closed session just to share the <coughs> reservoir's audit report which was prepared in 2016. I, I raised this with her actually at the meeting yesterday and it, it, it has to be taken on a strictly confidential basis. Um, so if, if members are content that we ask for that and do it in that manner. Um, so it will, it will be about restricting papers and obviously then you not sharing information um, coming out of that if you're content to, to do that. At um, great, okay, at page 92, we have the ministerial response to the meeting on the 9th of December. Um, the minister has stated that she will share with us um, in due course a copy of the departmental submission to the Union Connectivity Review, which I think members might find find useful. So if you're content that we may be right to her to ask for a copy of that submission when it's ready. I'm not clear whether or not that has been sent or not at this stage, but maybe just to, to, um, to let her know that we are interested in that. And at page 100, with the ministerial response to the committee's correspondence, and that's from the 16th of December and obviously some of that will include um, issues in relation to what we're going to be discussing today with the um, because at page, well, page 112 then we have the um, Department for the Economy's response with regards to um, to taxi operators and, and financial assistance for them um, but again all of these things are probably a little more complex than <coughs> at first reading particularly in relation to eligibility criteria at page four, we ha at a table at page four, we have the 18th report from the examiner of statutory rules, um, Angela Kelly, and she's highlighted two SRs, um, SR 2020-276, which is the Port Services Amendment, um, EU re Exit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and SR 2020-277, the Railways Amendment, EU Northern Ireland Regulations 2020. Um, the committee agreed that these agreed these statutory rules um, subject to the examiner's report um, and she's advised that she will not draw special attention to the assembly for either of those so do members have any comments on anything else within correspondence is there anything else that you want to discuss or that you want to seek further clarity on or are you content then just to um, agree the actions as suggested in the correspondence memo um, Chair. Mr. Muir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, page um, 111, so I'm just trying to work out the item that is. It's in relation to the budget and its um, correspondence um, from, um, I understand, the Finance Minister to the Chair of the Finance um, Committee in relation to that. And it's obviously concerning that no budget for next year has yet been published for consultation yet. And I just wanted to express concern around that because whilst we're considering the January monitoring round uh, today uh, of equal, if not more importance, is also the budget uh, for next year and the opportunity to be able to give that due consideration. Okay. Um, Cathy, are you you're aware, yeah. obviously, there's some more work being done with the committee? Yeah, the Committee of Finance is being briefed this afternoon by the Minister of Finance on the budget even though it hasn't been cleared by the executive. So if you want to listen in at two o'clock, you might hear more then. Okay, um, so we'll see how that goes this afternoon and if necessary, pick it up next week, because it's really important that that budget is published for consultation. Although during the briefing today, obviously, um, Linda may be able to give a little bit more information with regards to that um, from, on, obviously with regards to Johnny Mondring, but also the budget too. So that okay. might be something you might want to ask her. Sure, could I raise an issue? Dolores. Chair, uh, Chair, sorry, uh, in case I've, I've missed it, but given the response from uh, the Economy Committee about the taxi driver, you know, the operators, they were under the impression they couldn't apply to uh, Part B of the um, scheme. Could we maybe write to them and advise them and, and share our response with them that we have received? Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to 
I will, I'm guessing that they will probably be listening into this, but um, obviously we have a, a briefing from officials, um, or it's their second briefing from officials today will be in relation to that, so that may be one of the actions that we take maybe at the end of that session, if you're content okay, to do you. that. Um, although certainly through our, when the Deputy Chair and I met with the Minister um, before Christmas, um, we, we did suggest that, I suppose, that they, they did meet with the operators um, and, and have a, a, prop, a full conversation just in relation to um, what type of support they could give them and any sort of um, supplementary support. So was the, the challenge for the operators has been very much probably that they have been waiting, um, believing that, they, that there would be a bespoke package for them that hasn't actually appeared. So we can, if you're happy enough, that we can maybe wrap that up at that, that end of the session. Uh, yes, that's fine. I understand the minister met with them maybe yesterday or, or the day or two ago anyway, so it may well have been picked up. Okay. Um, any, any other comments? Yeah, Chair, Chair, I know it relates to some of the stuff there, but you know that we were contacted obviously by the haulage industry there over the last number of days. And is there any plans to set up a, a meeting or a committee to meet or anything in that? And also the the bus and coach representatives as well wanted to meet the committee. So that was that was any. yeah. The bus and coach was was agreed in at our last meeting, and that that's being that was going to be scheduled. Okay. Um, with regards to um, the request from Holliers, um, I understand that that was going to be set up as an informal meeting. Um, I haven't heard it, anything it, no, since it, Monday, so I think maybe they were looking to do something towards the end of the week. So um, we can we'll see. I suppose we can check and see what the situation so. is with them. I'll be enough of that. Content yeah. with that. Okay. okay. Chair, um, <clears throat> I, I'd just like to highlight the a meeting with the Holliers is probably even more urgent than, than previous. Um, uh, they were experiencing losses before, but now many of them are having to bring their vehicles back uh, without a back load, and that's completely upsetting uh, the, the transport infrastructure in Northern Ireland uh, in terms of getting food in here, but also in enabling, on occasions, uh, other items to be exported. So it's important, actually, that we would meet the hauliers as soon as possible. Their losses will be mounting. They have Many have, have brought back multiple lorries or have had lorries standing, uh, and their losses is considerably increasing. And therefore, the need for financial support and to resolve some of the issues around it is, is even more so than before. Well, certainly, they requested last week, and I, and I spoke to them, um, and they put an email around to all members. I'm not sure what the response was from members to that email. Um, certainly, um, we went back to, to say that we would be flexible and, and would meet with them. So I'm not really sure whether other committee members did likewise. Um, sure. So it is a bit trying to um, facilitate that. So, but, but I think it'd be helpful as a committee that we would meet them. That's what I'm saying. Okay, well. Um, does Andrew, we, Mr. Mayor, are you going to be? Yes. Yeah, I think it's important we as a committee do meet with them, and um, I think I asked to include Logistics UK and also the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium. These are important issues, and they're obviously of a immense priority. So I think it would be good if, the, as a committee, we could meet with uh, representatives from the haulage industry and also the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium. Okay, are members content? Yeah, we're content, Chair, because we went back to the member to, to the request. We responded to the request. Okay. We were happy enough to meet. So we'll, we'll try and facilitate that then within. Um, sure, I, I believe they, they are meeting other committees and that we have a more direct input. I know we're always highlighted in a few issues there, but there's other departments of a bigger in, input into the, some of those problems. So. That they are working away. They're meeting other groups. There's absolutely no doubt that there's a there's a massive challenge. It's really what this committee can do um, <coughs> as well. Um, certainly, we raised this that again with the minister yesterday, and I know that she's looking about trying to be flexible where she can with regards to ours and so on, and um, is ready to respond. But that may not that's not going to solve um, the main problems that they're experiencing. Yeah. Um, but members agreed. Um, Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments with regards to that? Okay, moving then to item six, which is subordinate legislation. Uh, we have SL1s, which are not subject to assembly proceedings, and if you're content, I'll take them in bulk. So page 297, we have SL1, the parking places, disabled persons, vehicles, amendment order 2020. Page 300, we have SL1, the parking and waiting restrictions, Belfast Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Um, 
we have at page um, 303 SL1, the loading bays on roads amendment order Northern Ireland 2021. We have at page 305 SL1, the parking places disabled persons vehicles amendment number two order Northern Ireland 2021. Um, four proposals for um, statutory rules setting new parking and waiting restrictions in a range of areas right across Northern Ireland. Um, in the sl ones department has set out the details of um, those changes and the reasons for them. Um, the proposals are not subject to assembly proceedings. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rules? Okay. Thank you. Moving then to um, item seven which is subordinate legislation, SRs, not subject to assembly proceedings. Um, there is one SR not subject um, to those proceedings at page 309. SR 2020-313, the parking places on roads and waiting restrictions, Newry, amendment number two, order Northern Ireland 2020. Um, and this is really to note the statutory rule unless you have any issues that you want to raise on the proposal. And I will defer to those who represent that area to know whether there are any issues. Is I'm content. No. Okay. So members are content. Agreed. Thank you. Item number eight, which is SR 2020-334, the Road Traffic Offenders Northern Ireland Amendment Order 2020. And that's at page 313. Um, we'd considered the proposal for the rule on the 30th of September and were content at that time. The rule is subject to affirmative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Yep. Okay, so the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-334 the Road Traffic Offenders Northern Ireland Amendment Order 2020 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules has no objection to the rule. Moving then to item nine, we have SR 2020-336, the Road Traffic Fixed Penalty Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2020. And uh, that's at page 321. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 30th of <coughs> September 2020 and we were content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with the rule? Mm -hmm. Do an implementation date. Mm -hmm. Did I read somewhere on that? It's yeah, something that's the 16th of December. Something that there's a date on that. Oh, uh, that was back. back yeah. Nine, yeah, three, two, one. Um, if you're content yeah, with that, and then we can, we, can, we can have the query, we can yeah, use yeah. the query on that. So the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-336, the Road Traffic Fixed Penalty Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Please. Moving then to item 10, which is SR 2020-338, or the regulation EC number 1370-2007, public services obligations in transport amendment EU exit Northern Ireland revocation regulations 2020, and that's at page 331. The committee considered this proposal for the rule on the 16th of December and was content. Um, the rule is subject to negative resolution and members will recall that we did spend some time on this. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are you content with the rule? I wish the, my opposition to be, then to be uh, recorded. Okay, that's noted. Um, so the, regu the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-338, the regulation EC number um, 1370-2007, Public service, service Obligations and Transport Amendment EU Exit Northern Ireland Revocation Regulations 2020 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules is no objection to the rule. Okay, Chair. thank you. Can I just answer Cathal's query? Um, 
both the Road Traffic Offenders Northern Ireland Amendment Act and the Road Traffic Fixed Penalty Order will come into operation the day after it has been affirmed by okay. resolution of the Assembly. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Moving then to um, our next item, which is item 11, and that's the departmental briefing. Um, just um, members, I'll draw your attention to the, the briefing paper for the in year monitoring and budget 2021 20, 22, and that's at page 341, and the, also the briefing paper at three, page 348, which is the monitoring round and COVID 19 pressures. And just um, remind members that this session will be recorded by Hansard. And we're going to welcome to the committee uh, Linda McHugh, who's the Acting Deputy Secretary for Resources, Governance and EU Group, um, Susan Anderson, who is the Director of Finance, and we were hoping to have um, Terry, Terry. Deegan, um, Head of Financial Planning and Management via Safety. And well, I see something's popping up here. Um, yeah, I know he ha he has had connection problems. Yeah. Oh, there he is. There he is. <laughs> very right. You're very welcome to the committee. Thank you. Okay. So, um, thank you, um, thank you all for attending. Uh, Linda, are you going to yes. make the initial presentation? I will. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to brief the committee today, um, and I welcome the chance to update members on the Department's in-year budget position and the draft budget submission for next year. I'd like to begin by apologising for having to reschedule our planned attendance at your last December meeting. As you know, the return date for January monitoring was the 4th of January, and it was necessary to reserve decisions until as late as possible to that date. Um, to include both the potential impact of weather conditions on resurfacing or repair work um, on the ground and also the likely extent of winter gritting or snow treatment that might be required. And each of those um, determines whether bids uh, or reduced requirements were needed in the monitoring round. And then in addition, um, the fast moving developments around the COVID outbreak and further restrictions also meant that significant changes to budget returns were required right up until the last minute. Um, as you've said, I'm joined today by Susan Anderson, who I think is her first um, appearance at this committee. She's our new finance director. Um, and by Terry, who's joining us um, uh, on um, Zoom. So in our last briefing to the committee on, on October the 7th, I uh, set out the department's submission on October monitoring. And following a very disappointing June monitoring outcome, where the department was unsuccessful in all of its bids, uh, in October we submitted bids for 4.6 million in resource and 9.1 million in capital. Resource bids covered roads maintenance, including winter maintenance and a forecast pay accrual to provide for the liability for the cost of staff leaving, a staff leave not taken in 2021, which must be accounted for. And in capital, we bid for 9.1 million to cover the Belfast Transport Hub, structural maintenance and street lighting, and the development of the new regional planning system. Only our capital bids were partially successful. Uh, so we got 1.6 million for the Transport Hub, and 2 million was allocated to partially address the 6.5 million bids for structural maintenance and street lighting. So turning now to January monitoring, uh, in terms of capital, there were two capital reduced requirements um, that we identified. One million in respect of reduced capacity to deliver work on the ground whilst maintaining safe working conditions due to the COVID <coughs> outbreak. And the spending profile of the planning portal project, which has been revised, resulting in a small reduced requirement of 0.6 million. In addition, in addition, some capital easements were identified, which are ring-fenced. Um, and therefore, those had to be submitted to the Department of Finance. These are 1.5 million um, in relation to the A5 scheme. Um, and it's been assessed that no construction will proceed within this financial year. And that as this funding is ring fenced, it must be returned to the Department of Finance. And 1.5 million technical reduced requirements, <coughs> mainly additional receipts, which again must be passed on to the Department of Finance. In terms of resource, there were no resource easements identified. However, one resource bid has been submitted. In October monitoring, a bid of 1.6 million was submitted for increased holiday carry forward, um, as I've outlined. This was calculated at that time on the basis of each member of 
departmental staff carrying forward the full allowance of nine days, plus five days accrued for the period in February and March um, 2021. Following a further review, this has been revised to 1.9 million to account for staff on long-term sick absence and maternity absence who will be carrying forward more than nine days. Um, and an additional 0.7 million has been added for DVA staff, which brings the total bid to 2.6 million. We have also taken the opportunity to make the Department of Finance aware of some additional COVID pressures which have arisen in the interim. Further pressures of 1.9 million from lost parking income and roads and a small amount of PPE costs and DVA have been registered. More importantly, we have highlighted to the Department of Finance that DVA utilised 10 million of its reserves to supplement lost income due to the COVID crisis. And unless that is reinstated, future capital investment may be hampered. So we've bid to um, uh, reintroduce or replace uh, the 10 million that has been spent out of reserves. And we await now the outcome of January monitoring. Moving on now to the 21-22 budget process. While the executive has not yet taken decisions on a draft 2021-22 budget, our understanding, based on the Northern Ireland settlement as announced by the Chancellor, is that the budget position will be very challenging in the next financial year. As part of the information gathering exercise, updated resource bids of 103 million, including EU pressures and COVID, were submitted as as detailed in the written briefing that we provided to the committee. These bids are essential to ensure the continuation of many basic public services, including the adequate provision of water and wastewater services and public transport. On the capital front, 562 million compared to a total capital <coughs> allocation of 558 million in 2021 is required simply to meet DFI's existing commitments without any further allocations outside these priorities. These commitments relate to flagship projects, NDNA commitments and other inescapable projects and those areas of business that are contractually pre-committed. Details of the various capital bids by category have been provided in the, the written briefing. Depending on the outcome for DFI, it is anticipated that a balance will need to be struck between maintaining existing infrastructure in water and sewage sewerage, public transport, the roads network and flood alleviation on one hand, while investing in new development, particularly in pursuit of the draft programme for government outcomes. So in closing, Chair, it's important to reiterate that the Minister is very keen to get the Committee's views and support in shaping and delivering improvements to people's everyday lives, and she welcomes your constructive challenge and input. I hope that this discussion today will help the committee understand better the challenges that the minister faces um, and the difficult financial decisions that will likely have to be taken in the coming months, potentially being compounded by whatever further impact the COVID pandemic has on public expenditure in the next financial year. So at that point, um, I'd like to uh, stop and Susan, Terry and I are happy to take any questions you may have. <coughs> Okay, thank you, uh, and thank you for um, presenting to us this morning. Um, I suppose um, the manner in which this is presented, I suppose, is, is quite challenging too, and, and guessing the, the timing that we're we are in, particularly around um, COVID, and um, I suppose it's about trying to um, sort of separate some of those processes mm -hmm. as well. Um, because obviously we have January monitoring, which sits on its in its, in its own right. We yep. have the budget as a as a normal process and a cyclical pro, uh, mm -hmm. process, and then we have COVID. So it's really about trying to to work out then um, the process f for COVID bidding uh, as well, which I'm assuming is 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 ongoing as opposed mm -hmm. to um, caught within those particular cycles, is that correct? Um, there have been, throughout this financial year, there's been the monitoring rounds and then there's been separate COVID, COVID bidding exercises. But we use January monitoring to actually update our COVID bids um, you know, to, to reflect the latest position um, because that, um, it was another opportunity to, to make sure that any pressures that had been identified <coughs> were actually logged. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything more. No, that's exactly right. Yes, so we, I suppose the COVID is an evolving um, pressure situation and we will continue to 
sort of assess what our pressures are. And again, if there's any additional funding that would come from Treasury, for example, then the Finance Minister would, um, I assume, issue another exercise. So we continue to look at these on an ongoing basis. Okay, and I you, sorry, I was just going to say you're right, Chair, that it is challenging because, you know, as COVID restrictions move and change, it clearly has knock-on impacts on income, particularly for um, uh, DVA, for TransLink, and for street park, you know, car, car parking, where there's fewer people <coughs> moving around and using car parking. So, you know, it's something that we have to keep under constant review. I suppose the, re the reason why I'm asking this. Uh, is because obviously for, for mo January monitoring, you're talking about the DVA lost income and about trying to reinstate reserves, and then the lost income from parking charges and PPE. And yet, whenever then we're looking at the um, the budget portion of the paper, mm -hmm. then you talk about COVID pressures, which are 50 million for TransLink, Northern Ireland Water 5.2, and so on. Um, and it's really about at what, what point then do you highlight? those particular challenges whenever you know today you know that those challenges exist yeah um well i suppose for, for next year's budget um i think we've had to separate out the covid um uh pressures because you know we're, we're being asked to, to work from a baseline from from this from the start of this financial year and clearly that didn't have any covid issue in it so i think it's really important that we we separate out what would be you know a normal expected uplift and what is an additional pressure because of you know things like loss of income through to COVID, due to COVID or additional operating costs <coughs> because of COVID, um, and, and that's why in the budgeting process those have been separated out, um, just to make it clear that you know we're not we're not bidding for a massive amount of money just because we want to do a massive amount more. It's it's because there is um, uh, a lot more pressure on on budgets. If that makes sense. No, no, and I, and I appreciate that. But I'm, I'm also mindful of the fact that the finance minister is setting on quite a sizable sum of COVID relief money, and it's about when that needs to be spent uh, and and how. Yeah. Um, and you know, if it does need to be spent very quickly um, by the end of this financial mm. year, um, is there capacity within the department to be? creative in order to be able to spend that to spend it appropriately and and target it mm -hmm. i mean we are we are looking at all and every option but clearly we have to do that within the confines of managing public money um so you know we're very mindful that that uh there is there seems to be money available this year and we are looking at ways in which we could spend but what we can't do is accept money that we can't spend because then it will result in an underspend. And this is where I think it's, it's very um, frustrating. Um, because, for example, on the capital programme, we know next year there is a big capital pressure. But we can't spend more money than we've already bid for because there is a capacity issue. And you know, particularly at this time of the year, it's very difficult to actually start new capital programmes and spend out within the, the confines of the financial year. Um, so we have maximised as much as we can bid for um, and, and usefully spend. Um, but as I say, you know, we are continuing to work with, with DOF. Um, and I know, you know DOF is working with Treasury um, to see you know, what flexibilities there might be. But clearly that, that's for, for DOF to, to take forward. Well, I suppose the worst, the worst situation would be that if we have money that could have been available and be used for the benefit of those in Northern Ireland yeah. and that has been kept aside, and I appreciate that it was sort of rainy day scenarios and things could have been worse, but mm. there has been additional money has been has been then allocated to Northern Ireland mm. and hasn't been used. And you know we have heard and we will continue to hear the plight of so many businesses, mm. um, and particularly within this committee for taxi drivers and operators mm. Mm. who are genuinely struggling. Um, as a consequence of COVID, and yet there is money there yeah. that hasn't been spent in order to assist them and to make them then ready for whenever yeah. COVID then um, starts to pass. Mm -hmm. um, 
because you know on a daily basis now we're hearing of businesses that are closing up because they can no longer be sustainable mm -hmm. and yet there's money in government that could be used in mm -hmm. order to, to assist them and you know this has been an ongoing challenge for us as a committee with regards to those particular um, businesses because they fall within our remit and you know I see that there was a bid for 19 million for taxi and haulage sector that all that money hasn't been spent either um, and really I suppose the challenge that I would want to put to you and to your officials would be to you know is there a way that you could be more creative in order to try to assist them um, and I appreciate that there was 1500 pounds has been given to those who have been eligible in order to meet certain costs but you know those are those that time has now passed they're still in a difficult mm -hmm. situation and you have all the, the, the information um, pertaining to those individuals that it would be easy then to create mm -hmm. another scheme in order to, to help them. Yeah. Well, um, I know my colleague Julie Thompson is following me um, and she will be able to report on the current position in relation to taxis and um, the, the support that, that um, uh, the Minister is giving to them. Um, but, you know, as I said before, I, I, I absolutely understand everything you're saying. We just have to make sure that, that we spend public money in a way that is accountable um, and, and justifiable um, and within the confines of managing public money. I mean, one of the areas that, that we um, have been, maybe not creative, but you know, we are trying to, to justify um, uh, getting more money is to actually uh, on the DVA side. So, you know, I've said that, that we are bidding for 10 million because the only way that DVA could actually operate this year was to start to eat into its reserves. Now, those reserves had been earmarked for the capital programme that it is planning, that DVA is planning in, in terms of replacing um, MOT test centres. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's a, they operate a trading fund, so they're allowed to keep reserves. What we are, I think, justifiably arguing is that they had to use those reserves just to keep their business going. We need to now, if there's an opportunity, to, to, to bid to replace those reserves so that actually the capital programme that they are planning in, in the coming years will not be impacted. So, you know, we're looking at opportunities like that to, to bid for additional monies while there is money available. Um, just turning to the, the, the monitoring round again, um, obviously October you bid for 5.5 million for structural maintenance and you were allocated two. Um, this, for January you haven't made a bid for structural maintenance but yet you have given back a million pounds um, in respect of reduced capacity to deliver work on the ground. Is that linked? Um, again, I think it's probably to do with timing. You know, had we, had we been successful in the October monitoring, there would have been time and the opportunity to actually gear up to deliver that structural maintenance. Um, I think now, at this point in time, you know, it's, it's too late to, to bid for a huge amount more structural maintenance. Um, it, it, it's again down to how much uh, work we can actually deliver on the ground within the current COVID climate. Okay. If I would just yeah. add in relation specifically in structural maintenance, we have um, identified a couple of small underspends in other areas which we have allocated then to structural maintenance where we can to, to be able to deliver within the capacity that we have. So again, we've been able to do that within the existing resources without needing to bid to the centre. Okay, and, and just finally, just in relation to the 0.7 million which has been added for DVA staff holidays, obviously this was highlighted in advance at a previous meeting with regards to holidays and so on, but is that particularly, that 0.7 million, is that for nine days carryover plus five? Is it is it being allocated in the same way as it has for the, for the rest of the department? Yes, yes it's yes. calculated on the same basis, absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr Boyle. Thank you, Chair. Linda, you're very welcome. Thank you. Very welcome. Um, Linda, yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it is slightly concerning, and I would like to support the Chair's comments in relation to support for the hauliers and the taxi industry and mm -hmm. trying to get that money out. And obviously, we're having a briefing um, afterwards in relation to it. But I just want to go to the, the, the road maintenance issue because normally at this time of year, if you're driving around between now and March of any year, Frantically, every road's been done and every pothole, and there's been money spent before the end of the financial year. And I'm just wondering, you bid for two million in, in the October monitoring round for essential road maintenance. Mm -hmm. I mean, where, where is that all? Because 
I mean, I'll, I'll read out a few wee roads here to you. You may never have heard of them, <laughs> but you'll remember them because, I mean, then daily, especially in UAR Armagh, especially the rural, rural part of it, there's a number of roads there that a number of councillors have requested, you know, fixed potholes, the deterioration and everything else. And here we see there's money being handed back and roads not being done. And it sort of defeats the purpose of it. We're bidding money and then we can't spend it. So <coughs> in that context, um, see the two million for essential road maintenance. Mm -hmm. what, can you specify exactly what it was used for or what in the October one? Um, I would need to um, uh, refer to my colleagues in Rhodes for a, a complete breakdown of where that money is being spent. I, I don't think we would have that level of detail here, but we can come back to you on that. No, it, it's just because, I mean, if I say to you Tim McCree or Tully Sarn or Darkley or mm -hmm. Darnus or Drum the Havel or, you know what I mean, Knock Bound, all, you know, all those roads, I could, mm -hmm. I could name a hundred roads yeah. and maybe every other member. And all I'm saying, one thing we're seeing here, there's money being handed back. Yeah. And normally this time of the year, because yeah. over the winter period, the, the roads do deteriorate that wee bit more yeah. after the snow and the frost. And, and I'm just concerned about that. Yeah. See, in terms of, of the, the, the million pound, the <coughs> one million pound handed back, can, can you specify it exactly why um, that was handed back? Let me just get my notes here now. Yeah, so um, again, you know, in, in terms of capital, I suppose the answer is that, you know, we are, we are, we've scoped with our colleagues in Rhodes um, exactly how much work they can take on between now and the end of the financial year. And, you know, th th they're not being shy about that. Um, yeah. But we do have to accept that, that some things have slowed down because um, of new working practices relating to COVID. Um, so, and, and as Susan has said, you know, it, it may look like we're um, not bidding, but it's because we we have been able to find other monies within confines of the departmental budget um, to, to put towards roads maintenance, um, so that you know anything that can be done will be done. But what we can't do is bid for work that we know we cannot deliver. So we're saying there, and I want to just you know praise some of the DFA because I mean. We have good working relationship yeah. with the local guys on the ground and yeah. the girls there and they assist us. But the thing is, I mean, you're, are we saying here reduce that million pound reduced capacity? You're saying we can't we can't get the contractors to do the work, or is this the issue, or is it because of COVID that we can't do the work? Because there's some of those issues are is, is essential work. Mm -hmm. and I mean, you know, fixing a pothole or, or you know fixing a part of the road. I think you know these opportunities should be taken now. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. And is, I was saying, is that the issue, why the million pound and reduced capacity is handed back, because we can't undertake that? Yeah, I mean, it's because we, we haven't got the capacity, either either we in the department or our contractors or however the work has been delivered. Um, you know, and it's because um, of the need to maintain safe working conditions um, because of COVID. It's just, it, it slows down the work. No, no one appreciate it. But my next question then would be, is that message getting then down onto the ground to the councillors and has been explained when they report something? You know, the message then is, listen, we, we can't do it because of these reasons. Well, I mean, I know my colleagues in Rhodes um, do have, they have very regular contacts with, with local councils and you would go around each council at least twice a year formally and, and they have many informal contacts. Um, so, you know, I, I, I can't speak for them, but, but I'm assuming that, that if questions are asked about why, why work's not being done, and if that's the reason, they would be articulating that back. No, and I appreciate it, but you can understand why. I mean, they're asking, yeah, yeah. we're asking for stuff to be done, and then we need no, to give no, an explanation yeah. as to why there's money being yeah. handed back. And, and, it was, yeah. just, and, and I appreciate your answers in relation to that. I just want to go on to the, the reserves, because it was 10 million. Yeah. Um, obviously, because of the lost income, the test, and everything else. What's the state of the reserves at the minute? Can you can you say or? Um, well, they're they're ten million less than they were. I don't. Have I don't have the exact no. figure on this. Terry. You see, just we'll, we'll follow on from that. I mean, and the impact this will have. The twelve months EECs are now up. Yeah. You know, I know some of them's getting six months and may get now six, but definitely the twelve month ones up. Um. That, yeah. How have you worked out that'll generate some income, or how does that? How do you? Yeah. Well, I know. I know. D again, DVA are um, building up their capacity because they're very aware that those extensions cannot be extended mm. further. So, you know, their challenge will be that, that by March they are going to have to 
um, be back up to, to full operation. Um, now, if, if you want more detail on that, again, Julie will have much more granular detail on that because that's her area of responsibility. But I do know that, that they're taking that very, very seriously um, and, and working towards that. And you know, that will all be factored in. It'll probably more likely hit into next year's budget, you know, where um, there'll be less of a, a downturn. That, that said, you know, the position on uh, driving tests uh, is clearly suspended at the moment because of COVID restrictions. So there is still some loss of income on the DVA side, it's not just MOTs. No, I appreciate that. I mean, I understand the difficulties we're all yeah. going to but, but just final point, uh, not so much of a question, but Linda, definitely in terms of road maintenance and essential maintenance, whatever you can do in terms of getting money down onto the ground. Yeah, and I know particularly at this time of the year, you know, with, with freeze thaw and um, potholes just get worse. Yeah. They certainly don't ever get better. No, absolutely. Yeah. That's, you know, yeah. where we can work with officials and the people on the ground trying yeah. to get down on. Thank you. And, and just for information, DVA will be at committee next week, so we'll be able to explore the okay. issues around okay. budget and the various thank you. Um, yeah. problems thank you very that they're much. experiencing. Okay, thank you, um, Deputy Chair, Mr Hildage. Thanks, Chair. Very welcome this morning. Uh, there has obviously been poor outcomes from the monitoring rounds uh, this current financial year, nothing in June, and then limited uh, figure for October. Uh, part of that was actually, I think, even the transport hub, which was probably ring fence money coming mm -hmm. back in that time. Mm -hmm. so that just maybe took the bad look of it, but it hasn't been good. Uh, is, there, did you, is there any reason why the department hasn't been performing on the monitoring rounds or have been ignored potentially? Or is there any um, issue I'm, that you have? Yeah, I mean, I, I think clearly there's been such a pressure on um, the Northern Ireland Block budget because of largely COVID, um, and, and to some extent, you know, additional pressures caused by the preparations for EU exit. Um, so, you know, we're not taking it personally. Um, and I mean, we do bid as hard and as um, vehemently as we can, um, but at the end of the day, it's an executive decision about where priorities go. Uh, just on some, I know the minister was very keen to let the, the uh, public see uh, delivery on the ground and, and, and bring the confidence back into some communities which have been lagging through street lighting and various things. Uh, one scheme which was spoke about previously was a 20 million an hour scheme for yep. the, the schools. Has that money been secured uh, for that? Uh, yes, and, and actually um, we're in the process of um, implementing that, I think, in outside 100 schools. Um, so, so that is going forward. That's going forward. There, there is a bit of an issue, I understand, about steel at the moment because of EU exit, um, which may delay things. But um, we're hoping that that will be resolved and we can get going on that because that's clearly a ministerial priority. Yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, just a couple of other bits and pieces there. The staff recruitment at two million, is that... Would that be a normal figure? Uh, <coughs> staff recruitment. Um, that would be high. Sorry. I wonder is that related to... Come, come, yeah. come in there. Yeah. Uh, just on the staff recruitment, that, that's a very unusual thing for, for DFI. Um, and it's simply to reflect the fact that since VES, the numbers of staff have reduced significantly and um, we, we have a requirement for essential staff to take forward initiatives uh, in terms of programme for government, etc. So this is, it is a very unusual thing to be bidding for staff. I've never seen it in the last 15 years. Um, so it is unusual, yes. Things go round in circles, don't they? <laughs> have to replenish the stocks. Huh? Uh, just on the lost revenue from the parking situation, uh, your bit, 1.9 million. Mm -hmm. There already was a payment out, payments out of 3.7, something like that. Yeah, so. Are still people operating? Yeah. Reduced our parking fees and stuff like that. Um, well, I think I think the problem is that there are fewer cars wanting to park um, in town and city centres um, for on-street parking, which is where the, the revenue comes from. 
Um, so it's, it's basically, again, a, a, I think a direct result of restrictions that here people are, are travelling into towns and cities. Um, so but the charges are back on again. They were dropped around the first period of COVID. As, as I understand it, I think they are still, yeah, they are still there. Um, so it's, it's not that, so that it's we've dropped then? charging. It's just uh, less use. Reduction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, we spoke about the 19 million there for the, the COVID assistance for uh, the taxi drivers, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what remains of that 19 million? Um, I think it would be better to ask Julie that, just because I know that they are still working through the um, through the payments. I, I think is it 15 odd million that has been paid out. I think Julie probably would be able to give yeah. a more up to date figure. Yeah. Um, Julie will be able to give you a much more up to date figure when, when she joins us after, after we leave. Um, oh, no problem. And the the NDNA 25 million is that basically solely for the low emission buses? Then is that? Um, yes, so so um, that's for uh, Translink um, and their low emission buses. Right. Okay. Um, does, it, does it include anything else? I don't think so. Anything okay. else in the ND? Yeah, no. we, can do, we can double check and come back to you unless Terry, do you have. Uh, $25 million is for low emission buses, yeah. yeah it's so, yeah. $25 million in this year and $25 million next year. I don't think it's including anything else, but. It's only yeah. for buses, probably? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Okay, well, um, 14 million was bid for for the taxis, and 5.3 million, according to our papers for the next session, has been allocated so far. So it looks like there may be an underspend. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have been working with clearly our, our colleagues, and I think they are looking at um, how much they can actually spend, but we haven't surrendered. Not yet. So you know we. Clearly, there, there is room to go um, on the, the support for taxis. Well, according to um, correspondence from the Minister in, in our papers today, um, there's 25 million, although 19 million um, has been allocated for taxis and coach operators. There's still 6 million then being left centrally with the, the Minister of Finance. So it's really, I mm suppose -hmm. there's still a number of questions in relation to that and yeah. how that can be spent then by the end of the year. Yeah. And I think that, that would depend on, on where the Minister wants to, to, to go in terms of, of support for taxis and buses. But we are there, we are under time pressure for yeah. all of these things, so you know there really yeah. isn't an awful lot of time now for for thinking. It's about yeah, yeah. sort of action at this stage, I suppose. Um, Mr Muir. Thank you very, um, very much, Chair, and um, thank you for the information around the monitoring round and the information that's we're in a very difficult situation here at the present moment. Time to understand the pressures. Um, just I will also declare there was previously an employee of TransLink. Um, as a result of the bids made, would this bring the reserves for the different uh, bodies under the remit of the department up to um, the level pre prior to the pandemic? Um, it would for DVA, it wouldn't for TransLink, not not with these bids. Okay, and can I ask why then a higher amount hasn't been bid for, conscious of the issues in recent times really over the last number of years really around the concerns around reserves and the ability for TransLink to continue? And, and that's something that's under active consideration um, in addition to, to this. Um, you know, I, I think at the moment, um, we were looking at the losses that TransLink had made, um, and that's what the bids to date have been based on. Um, but you know, it's back to can we be creative at this point in time? Um, I mean, it will ultimately be an executive decision, but that is something that that we we are looking at. Yeah, and just conscious, and I would agree with the points made by the chair around the monies that are uh, we have at the moment. And there's a real risk that they could end up being surrendered back to Westminster um, and to Her Majesty's Treasury if they're not spent by the end of this financial year. So it is ensuring that we're able to yeah. give that maximum benefit. And you know, one of the other issues is around the structural maintenance, and that's been discussed. But I'm still struggling to get a full understanding of why we haven't been able to bid for more money and be able to get more of that activity occurring on the ground, because it's not for a lack of 
projects that um, you know that need to be undertaken. I would less learn from my arm of people in my own constituency, you know, and, and wanting you know works undertaken. But I'm just trying to understand, you know, what what is the blockage here in terms of being able to undertake this work? Yeah. So you know, I, I absolutely understand the frustration, um, but we have to make sure, as I said, that that if we bid for money, we can spend it, um, and it's. Um, the uh, assessment of our colleagues in roads, but what is being bid for is what can physically be delivered on the ground between now and the end of March. Um, I mean, we can ask for more detail if you want about where the blockages are, but I, I'm assuming it's both within um, the capacity of contractors to undertake work um, and the capacity of the department <coughs> to, to deliver the, the, um, the work on the ground. Um, it would be appreciated to get that information so we can go back to constituents because they're coming to me going, you know, there's so many issues needing to be addressed and why can't that work be undertaken? And then if we have a situation where there's a risk of money being surrendered back yeah. to Treasury, you know, it's very hard to justify it. And just w one last thing, um, the, the department ran um, a grant scheme for uh, road safety and there was um, 61 applications submitted but 47 of those were rejected. Um, so there is a strong demand by communities to be able to undertake road safety work, uh, but yet those applications were rejected and th there was a you know, a cap on the scheme of £100,000. And I just wanted to know why additional funding has not also been bid for those road safety grants, because that's uh, as some of the other members of the committee will, will uh, agree, possibly. Um, that work by community groups is the core of road safety, and it helps us to raise awareness around those issues. Yeah. I mean, again, we, we can ask the, the part of the department that's responsible for that particular scheme, um, you know, why there was such a, a high rate of rejection. I mean, it, it could be for all sorts of reasons. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, why they're not bidding for more money. But again, I suspect that's because you know, there is only so much capacity within the department to deliver um, projects between now and the end of the financial year. Um, mm -hmm. We'd well, appreciate it to find out a bit more about that, because obviously there's quite a lot of people, as you said, have been rejected. And it would have been good to be able to fund them. Okay. Thank you, okay, thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Lyndon and Susan, um, for this morning. Um, just, I suppose, going back to, to some of the points already made around the, the one million that's being returned, um, you know, it's obviously very disappointing, and I know we're in, in very challenging times, but I think, you know, one of the, the arguments we've been told repeatedly from the Minister is if I had more money, if the Finance Minister gave me more money, I could do X, Y and Z. And I think the, the information we're getting here this morning, that argument now falls flat on its face because, um, you know, as, as Cahill has, has pointed out about the number of roads that are still in, in dire need of, of repair and maintenance and all of that, um, and we're handing a million pounds back. And I understand we're in, um, you know, very, very challenging times, but I think I just want that put in the record because that's something we're hearing repeatedly. And, and you know, the department have got one of the highest budgets in, in, in years. Um, so it's just to point that out. One of the, the, the issues I want to raise just was around the winter gritting. Um, and, and if we have, um, you know, a prediction on, on the demand for gritting in the coming weeks, I know, um, particularly last week, um, when, when we've seen the, the heavy frost and, and, and snow and ice coming in, there there's always seems to be a scramble trying to, to get to areas that most need it. Now, I was contacted by a lady who, who lives um, in Catesbridge, actually, but uh, uh, she knew me, so she'd contacted me. You know, they were facing uh, temperatures of minus seven, mm -hmm. and there wasn't even a grip pile. So, you know, left on the road. Now, it's being dealt with, but I suppose the, po the point I'm making is... We need better planning in terms of, of you know, grit boxes being filled, all of those things that we know are coming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and again, it's nearly by the time we get... And, and don't get me wrong, the guys on the ground are very good and once they've been contacted, they respond to it and they're getting out to it, but sometimes it's nearly too late because yeah. the, the, the weather has passed. Um, so it's just to say, going forward, what sort of preparation and planning we're doing in terms of, of demand. Okay. Um, well, I mean, on your first point, I, you know, I know it's frustrating that, that to see money going back. I suppose the point I would make is that it's a very different proposition being given a budget at the beginning of April and being able to plan ahead and being able to plan a full programme of capital works um, compared to, you know, what you can do in January 
Uh, and in fact, by the time we, we, we get the outcome of this, it could very well be the end of January. So you've got two months then to spend money. And I think you know nobody would have predicted at the beginning of the year just how much our capital programme would have been impacted by, by COVID. Um, and you know I, th I think um, we have we had really serious concerns actually um, back in spring that um, the construction sector would be very very slow in getting back. So you know, in some respects we've done better than we than we thought we might at one point in the year um, when all our plans were turned upside down. Um, and I know you know this isn't just a frustration for. Um, colleagues in, in the department itself, but but in our big ALB, so in Northern Ireland Water and TransLink, they're always making the point that, you know, they're given a budget at the beginning of the year. Um, they, uh, so, and quite often that's not as much as they need. And then come January, there's money available. And at that point, they then can't spend it because there's not the, enough time to spend. Um, and the other issue, of course, is that we roll from one year budget to the next. And when you're trying to plan very large capital programs, you know, that's very, very difficult. Um, you know, the, the, there are many other things that will delay a capital programme, including objections, planning issues, um, you know, uh, all kinds of things. And, and, you know, when we look at the A5, the delay has been because the, of the inspector's report, and that's why we're not able to spend that money in this financial year. So, you know, there are many external factors that will determine whether or not the minister can fully spend out her budget. Um, but I don't think that t that takes away from her point that if she was given more budget at the beginning of the year, we could clearly do an awful lot more with it. Um, it's just money at the end of the year is very, very difficult when it comes to capital, particularly. I suppose on that point you could say that we could all do an awful lot more with more money, do you know what I mean? But I suppose yeah. we have to be realistic in what you can deliver, and, and yeah. that's the point I'm making, yeah. is that, you know, if and, and I suppose in April... We might not be able to foresee exactly where we, ha we are now, but the point I'm making is that you know even locally, um, and some of the minister's colleagues not repeatedly you know say this that the minister for finance give us more money, but there's two, it's a different thing getting more money and, and being able to, to spend it, and mm -hmm. that's the point I'm making. So yeah. I don't want, I don't want to labour on it, but it was yeah. just I think you know when 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 members of the public hear that there's one million pound or whatever going back, mm -hmm. and they're sitting with yeah. with huge potholes on their roads and not and no action. Yes. Um, they will be wanting to know why, uh, and I just wanted to clear that up. But um, so it, it, that's that's fair enough. I take yeah. the point as well. Okay. Uh, if I could come in at that point, just to say about the, the underspend um, and the, the amount the money that's being handed back. Um, the money that's being handed back is capital, so it can't be used in the current year, given the state of the year we're at. Um, but in terms of the, the amounts of money, COVID has really allocations, as the chair has, has said, have, have really overtaken in-year monitoring this year. It's been much more significant amounts of money than in-year monitoring. So the department has received some 208 million of COVID money and it, and it has spent all of that today and it, it anticipates spending all of that and um, not handing anything back at all and uh so it, it, it has been dominated by by covid and and in the year and the, the department has a very good reputation in fact normally this time of year the department would be a, a safety valve for other departments for unspent her capital and and that we could use it on on the ground but simply simply because of COVID, uh, we can't spend the structure maintenance on the ground because of conditions, working safely, et cetera, don't allow it. So that, that's, so we, we are handing back a very small amount of capital, um, but we are, we're still spending 80 to 90 million pounds on structure maintenance and significant amounts, 200 odd million in terms of COVID expenses. So there's a huge amount of money being utilized and, uh, Creative might be difficult for accountants. It's a bit of an oxymoron for, for account, accountants, but uh, w the department is uh, expending significant amounts of money and hasn't up to now handed anything back at, at all, simply just because um, the state of the year and because this capital money can't be spent between now and the end of the year. Okay, um, thank you. Can I just pick up on a point you've made there? Um, and while I totally accept what you're saying, a lot of the COVID money is really plugging the hole that was created 
by um, <coughs> inactivity, be it for TransLink and, um, and supplementing an income. And really, I suppose what the committee is challenging you with today is the fact that you know, we would have liked to have seen and would continue to see, because this isn't obviously going to go away anytime soon, but challenge the, the department to be more creative um, and going beyond what it normally does. Um, rather than just plugging holes, but actually looking to see how you can do your uh, and, off and create an offering that is different to what you have been doing. Yeah, and you know, as I said already, we, we are looking at being creative, but we have to be mindful that we have to do that within the parameters both of the priorities of the department and in terms of, of making sure that we follow the, the rules under managing public money. Um, because you know whether there's a surplus or not, it's still public money, and we need to be conscious of that. And don't don't cut, go away from this committee. I'm thinking that I'm going to ask you to do anything that you're not. <laughs> with, you don't have the yeah. varies to do. Yeah. What I am asking you to do is to think creatively around yeah. that and to use the powers which you do have. And there are departments, and I and I'm not defending any department um, or defending any minister. Whenever I say that there are those who have huge number of schemes um, waiting to go and have, are being delivered and yet the department is looking after one scheme yes. um, you know so there there's an opportunity yeah. there also for um, the department yeah. of infrastructure to start to look at doing yeah. something Although, a bit different bear in mind that is one scheme that we did not have the powers to do and we needed to seek powers to be able to do that one yes but you, the, and we've the, got the, those now. You, you have those powers yes. now, and you could have had those powers earlier had you requested those. I no doubt. Um, you know, so it's it's about looking at how you, how you how you do things, and you know, I think that's really what I want you to get from this meeting today mm -hmm. too. Is I'm just putting that challenge to you for the next time, I suppose. Okay. Thank you. Because this isn't going, but this isn't no, going no, away, no. and I think we have to recognise that. And it yeah. isn't just about plugging holes; it's about looking about. And the minister has said that she wants to do things differently. Um, you know, so we're actually asking you to do that. Yes. Um, and 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 her also. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Come on, my band. No, no, no. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Totally agree, Chair. Totally. I, I have a couple of other questions, Chair. Is that okay? Oh, right, okay. Sorry, I thought you'd finished. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was just, it, it, there's only just one on, on street lighting. Um, obviously, there's column replacements, so it's just to try and get an update on that. And if we could, and it, you might not have the information no, to plan, Linda, but <laughs> to see how many columns are still over the 40 year old mark, because I know there have been work ongoing um, on that. So, and I think it's a very important piece of work. Mm -hmm. um, and just a final point on what, on what the chair has said there, too, about you know, getting the power to, to um, provide support and, and around thinking creatively. One of the key issues we've raised repeatedly in here was around the haulage sector. Mm -hmm. And whilst we have come up with schemes for taxi operators, taxi drivers, um, the bus and coach sector, there's been nothing forthcoming. And I mean, we warned about this and now we're, they're doubly compounded in terms of Brexit mm -hmm. and, and all of that. And I know we're going to speak about some of that later, but I think, you know, there's definitely scope there that the, that, that the minister and the department could have looked at and, and tried to be creative and and, and work on that because I think every department has had to do that mm -hmm. uh, because of, of the times we're living in. So I just I just want to make that point. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Okay. Thank you, um, Linda, <coughs> Susan, and Terry in the distance there. Just pick up on David's point earlier. Refer to the schools, uh, Linda. You know mm -hmm. the hundred schools that you're doing. I think the budget, am I correct, was two million to do that. Yeah. Do you see that all being spent on that? Or obviously that's roughly twenty thousand per school. I presume that's. Do you see more schools being done? And do you, there was talk that there was going to be more schools rolled out in the future. Mm -hmm. so do you see the two million being spent totally? And do you see another allocation of money to do more schools? Yeah, well, certainly nothing's been surrendered. Um, so, you know, that's the first phase. Um, I suppose it'll be for the Minister and my colleagues in, in Rhodes to determine whether it needs to be rolled out further. Just on that, if, if, that, if that is a basis of 20,000 per school, I think that's probably not the most efficient way to do that. We're big into SIDS, and I'm a big SID advocate. It's a far cheaper and more effective way of doing it at schools to indicate speed. I appreciate you then have to put in law that it's a 20 mile or zone, but it's a very expensive way of you know reducing speed. And ultimately, personally, I don't see it working. And some of the colleagues within road service will tell you that they don't see it working because it does not indicate the speed you're doing. It just tells you it's a 20 mile or zone. Therefore, it's not the same catchment. So while you feed that through, just a better and simpler and cheaper way of doing that and ultimately getting more schools and more effective way of doing that. Uh, just to pick up on the, the point of the one million, and I appreciate other colleagues have spoken on this, 
At what point did the Department realise that one million had to be returned? At what point in time, from a calendar point of view, do you discover a right with a million access here that has to go back? Um, I suppose it, it was it was all done in terms of the calculation of, of January monitoring. Yeah. So you know it was right up to the very beginning of, of January um, because you know as I said in my opening remarks, um, <laughs> the budget this year has been a bit of a movable feast. Um, so you know what we had to do was was determine you know what could what could be spent. Um, and what was left over, and, and actually within the department's own um, uh, budget remit, you know what we could move around to, to either, um, you know, maximise well, maximise how much we could deliver and not not hand back. So you know that's where Susan has has explained that so, so you know, there's a bit of internal movement. So for example, on, on structural maintenance as well, you know we were able to, to use some other underspends to, to to make sure that we maximised how much. We could spend on structural maintenance, but um, this year it was it was right up to the fourth of, of January when we were still putting figures to the minister, and, and uh, clearly she had to then determine um, what she was prepared to put forward. So, just on, on was in Mr. Boylan's point, referred a list of roads, and we all could list those roads. I, I don't. I'm not disagreeing with your comments, Linda, but there's not one engineer probably in Northern Ireland that you could go down and say I've got a million pound. And you say them in the middle of January, could you get that spent by the mm -hmm. by the end of March? They could spend it mm -hmm. because, the, as we know, resources, potholes, and capital is bigger. But I, I have people in Upperlands walk on a quarter of a mile, no footpath. They're actually walking on the road between 100 houses and the village. Yeah. So that money could be spent. And I'm not yeah. disagreeing with your yeah. points on, on Terry's yeah. points. There's not one engineer if you said them have a million pound fee in the start of January, you couldn't get that spent by March. And I don't mean waste it. I mean mm -hmm. spend it effectively. Yeah. So we shouldn't be having that money back because we're all trying out to get these areas fi fixed and appreciate the, the difference between resource and capital. So I think it's unfortunate that's going back. And I spent half a day with, I refer to my engineer, the engineer at Ulster, mm -hmm. looking at this, this and this, and he's always saying no money. Mm -hmm. So that does not warrant what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I suppose, again, I, I understand the frustration, but um, any work that has to be done has to be done through proper procurement yeah. methods, and, and you know that there, there's there's methodologies for doing all of this, um, and there is a capacity issue, you know, and, and we can't get around that. You know, we only have a finite number of staff in the department, and we have a finite number of of staff within the contractors that we are contracted with to deliver all of this, and it's that combined capacity that is is driving the amount of work that can be done in any one financial year. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Anderson. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, Linda, for appearing in front of us today. Um, Chair, I just want to concur uh, with what you said, and I think, Linda, I know you realise um, how to get access to the Financial Assistance Act, and I'm sure that your department um, gained a lot of hope when your minister put in for it and late on a Friday afternoon and got their green light on a Saturday. So saying to us as committee members that your department doesn't have the powers, I think you're dealing with members who understand how quickly you can get those powers. And therefore, I would encourage you not to be coming in front of the committee uh, telling us you don't have the powers and that's the reasons why you can't take action forward because we know in terms of taxi drivers and unlike what was said, I know it was probably a misunderstanding, but taxi operators haven't been sorted out yet, nor have hauliers. So, but we'll deal with that in the next session, Chair. Can I ask you, um, just Andrew, Andrew Murr, our member of the committee, had talked earlier before you come in about the budget. And I know the finance minister is in front of the committee today, but in terms of us as members, we want consulted, we want to scrutinise, and we want to understand the planning. So as far as I understand, and I'm asking you for your opinion, Linda, do you know, can you give us any clarity on that? Is the budget paper uh, getting blocked from being discussed even at an executive? And has that been the case even before Christmas? I wouldn't have any information on that. I mean, that's an executive matter. Um, you know, clearly, the, the budget paper was drafted and we have responded to it um, and our minister has commented on it. Um, but it's up to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister what gets put onto the agenda for an executive meeting. Well, the reason why I asked you, because, Linda, of your own role with the budget, I'm sure you would be concerned. 
uh, it's been reported that the economy minister wants a finance minister to read budgets like your own to plug a gap from the loss of EU funding. Now, the irony of that might be lost in people who have campaigned for Brexit and then realise there's 100 million coming out of their budget every year. But I'm wondering, is your minister then defending her own budget against it being cut in that way to replace EU funding? Um, our minister has um, you know, looked at, at what we believe we need to fulfil the obligations of the department next year, and that's what she's bidding for. Um, is she concerned that the reports, because it's quite public, that are out there, that um, other budgets are being asked, uh, the finance minister has been asked to cut other budgets to plug a hole in the Department of Economy, budget because of uh, the removal of EU funding, 3.5 billion is being removed from, from the north every tranche, and there's 100 million coming out of, um, unfortunately, the Department of Economy every year. Um, are you across that? And just, I'm just a wee bit concerned because of that uh, pressure is there attempts being made to put that pressure on the finance minister who's resisting it, obviously, because he's defending all the budgets. Um, but I'm wondering, is your own minister across that? Um, I, I, I can't really comment on discussions between the Department of the Economy and the Department of Finance. No, but it's an impact on your budget. Could you, you're one of the budgets that they're asking to be cut. They're asking the department budgets to be cut so that there's a, a plug in a hole in another department. So that's what I'm concerned about. Well, all I can say is that our minister has put a very compelling case for why she needs the budget that she needs. Um, but I think we're, we're all very conscious that there will be a huge pressure on the Northern Ireland bloc because of the statement made by the Chancellor that we're basically um, you know, looking at the baseline for this year, nothing more. I'm sure you appreciate that. That's really concerned everybody. Yeah, Lynn, I'm sure you appreciate we as members, we're looking you know, to scrutinise mm -hmm. uh, and the reduced time now is going to impact on the consultation and planning. But look, I'll move on. In your departmental resource pressure, you cite 3.6 million for issues relating to Brexit and the implementation of the protocol. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, again, that, that's an estimate um, of how much additional um, uh, cost there may be, um, but it is an estimate at this point in time. Um, as you will appreciate, you know, we are still working through the impact of the protocol um, and how it relates to the, um, the trade agreement um, and what that actually means, um, what that will mean in practice. Um, and have you an understanding, Linda, of what the 3.6 million would be, even if it is in only an indicative figure? Or, you know, the, I mean, what exactly is this going to be spent on? Yeah. Do you have any <clears throat> breakdown on that? Yeah, yeah. so approximately 1.3 would be in relation to staffing costs, so additional staff that will be required um, to work through the various things that Linda has mentioned. And the balance then of mm -hmm. 2.3 would be for NI water, potentially. And again, this is very much an estimate in terms of additional chemicals, for example, that may be, be needed. And I stress again, that's an estimate at this stage, and we'll continue to refine that. Chair, well, I, I find that quite interesting because Chair, when NA Water and other officials were in front of us, we had asked, was there going to be any cost implications for the uh, increased cost of chemicals as a consequence of Brexit? And, uh, and we were told that the supply chain would not be affected in that way. So I wouldn't mind, Chair, if we could get more information on that. So I, I can appreciate what we received here today in terms of variables, but I wouldn't mind a written report from Linda if you could get as much more information on that in terms of the chemicals, because we suspected, some of us on the committee, that there would be an increased cost. Chemicals would cost more because of Brexit uh, and the supply chain and where we got the, the chemicals and the materials from, because we know NI water couldn't stockpile because of these chemicals being dangerous. So can we get a wee bit more information on that, Chair, yeah, for I, the members? Yeah, I think it is important just, just to stress there's a difference between um, getting chemicals and the cost of the chemicals. So, you know, whilst um, there, there is a sufficient um, buffer um, to get over any short-term delay in the supply of chemicals that, that may be created as the new systems bed in, um, you know, we're not over the line yet in terms of additional costs in terms of transportation um, or yeah, not, you know, yeah. customs. That, and Linda, that's what, we were, that's what we differentiated from, was the cost that was going to be incurred uh, because of Brexit 
um, that there wasn't going to be, thankfully, we're, we're not going to be without the chemicals, but Brexit was going to add an additional cost to them. Um, Linda, you cited 150,000 um, of COVID pressure for PPE for DVA staff. Uh, what's the current stock of PPE for staff, not just for DVA, but maybe across the department? Um, I don't have that figure. Um, I, I, I know that there have been no issues highlighted. Um, you know, uh, uh, myself and, and, and Susan, and in terms of um, procurement, um, you know, we have been regularly um, bringing together both the core departments, DVA, TransLink and Northern Ireland Water, to look at procurement issues. And there's, there's been a, a lot of focus over the past nine months on, on the provision of PPE. And whilst at the beginning it was a very challenging process, I have not had any um, reports um, in, in the last maybe five or six months that there's been any issues around PPE. Um, but again, we can double check that if you... Yeah, the, chair, the committee could be informed about that. Chair, the A5 inspector's report, I think we were told by previous officials in, in November that it had been on their desk and they had um, given that over now to the minister. So that was in November and I'm conscious um, that this report and waiting on this report has been going on for years. Um, can we get an indicative time from the minister now that we are in January as to when she's going to respond to the findings of that report? And uh, if you could ask the minister on our behalf if we could get an indicative time in for that. Okay, something that the committee can write to the minister or separately. Okay. okay. And just finally, one, one issue that was mentioned on Britain, and everyone's mentioned in their constituency, so I'm going to mention Kingsford uh, in, in Derry, and I only use that as one example. There are many others. There's uh, Ardenry is, a, is present as an issue, that is an area, for instance, in Kingsford. And Chair, I'm sure every member would, uh, would have similar experience. That's an area that's populated mainly by older people. And even though there are grit boxes there, the grit and boxes and the times they are full, so that's not the issue that I'm raising. It's trying to get them spread. And it's an area that carers are in and out of the area. And I would say it's almost 100% nearly populated from an older, vulnerable um, you know, constituents. So what I have asked the department, and then I don't know if you would be the conduit to this or chair, we can come back and consider this. It's not one size fits all. Where there are main roads, and we know the gridders will only go into certain roads, but perhaps based on need and a demonstration of evidence that you would have maybe those roads gridded as opposed to having to depend on someone from the area to come out and spread the, um, the, the salt around the area around when there's particularly when it's very bad, if it's the temperatures have dropped. And um, so it is a discussion I think worth having here for another time that we don't just have the one size fits all, uh, particularly when we're trying to get access into those areas. But I don't know if that's something that we should raise here with Linda or that I should come back to you chair and another, with another, other officials for another discussion. Might be something that yeah. we need to speak to those within through the roads um, so. yeah. Yeah. particularly so we can maybe schedule a briefing at some stage with them to talk about winter service and so on so that might be useful to do that yeah okay. anything else are you content to move on okay thank you um mr beggs Again, Linda, thanks for your, yeah. your background briefing. It must be a busy time. Uh, it certainly is. <laughs> monitoring around and COVID spent manager all to be juggled at the one time. Um, and indeed plan next year's budget as well. Now, in terms of the October monitoring rounds, one of the bids that was unsuccessful was a million pounds for a regional planning system. Mm -hmm. I don't see it mentioned subsequently. Is that just dropped off or are we still uh, uh, implementing a new regional planning system or what's happened? I oh, know it's definitely being implemented. Um, I think at one point we wanted to bring um, uh, spend forward because actually ultimately it was going to save money um i think we have managed to find that but now that there's been an easement um again because of of the um 
the cost projections in, in, in terms of, of the delivery time? Do you have more detail? That's right, yeah. yes. A revised payment schedule has been agreed with the contractors, so it is still proceeding. It's still proceeding on the same time scale. It's just that the payments will be made at different times and will now fall into next financial year rather than this financial year. This is the new system that most, virtually all councils have bought into as well, so it is quite important. It yeah, is no, it's, okay. it's, it's for the department and 10 of the 11 um, councils as planning authorities. Yep, okay, thanks for that. Um, then, in terms of um, the bid uh, for uh, the unusual bid for um, support for recruitment, um, can you tell us what has gone wrong? Is it, and and is, is this bid purely to fund the recruitment, or is it also funding uh, the actual salaries of some of the posts? Oh no, it would be for salaries. Um, the, there's, it's, it wouldn't include costs for the actual recruitment. Right, OK. So, so how many posts and what are the critical posts that have been overlooked that they're not currently in place? Uh, that I would need to get more detail on. Yeah, we uh, wouldn't have that level um, OK. I mean, I, mean I, I think some of it is because, you know, uh, post-VES, we were a department delivering a number of things now. There's been things added to that list. Um, you know, including some sort of flagship and NDNA um, commitments. So I'm assuming it's because we need to re-gear for our current commitments. Um, okay. but, but we need to get you a breakdown. So, so that'll be an ongoing resource cost. It's not just a one-off cost then. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Um, then uh, turning to another area then. Um, in, in terms of specifically uh, EU pressures, you've, you've listed. Um, Cost of the protocol on Northern Ireland Water. What is the cost to the department in the protocol? What, what's what's been uh, this money here being used for? Uh, the 1.3 million, and is that how long is that bid to last for? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, a lot of it will be on salaries um, uh, because. There is a lot more work to be done now in terms of overlaying the impact of the protocol on our legislation, um, on the way we operate. Um, and you know, there's a lot of work now that needs to be done um, to, to uh, make sure that we're that we understand both the impact and then also look at how we develop. Um, our policies in the future, and we touched a bit on this when, when I was up speaking to you about, about common frameworks. You know, there is a there will be a new way of looking at policy, and it won't be just either taking an EU directive or looking at what GB does, um, because we are in this very unique position where you know, in many respects, we are going to have to continue to comply with EU laws and and, and, and standards and legislation. Um, whilst also um, looking at uh, what is happening in GB. And, and so I, th I think there's going to be additional pressures in terms of um, working through all of that. Um, some of it might be a temporary thing until we get our heads around exactly what the protocol and the impact is, um, and we're on a much more even keel. Um, so some of it might be temporary, some of it might be more permanent. This this 1.3 million uh, bid that you have here that's referred to, is it purely for this next financial year for this one-off period? Yep. Uh, yes. Although, as I said, s some of it might have a tail into future years. Um, you know, it I suppose it depends how this year, this coming year goes. Okay. Turning then to um, how you, uh, you, we we plan future uh, capital expenditure. Mm -hmm. um, there are areas which there's been executive commitment for, which are deemed to be the, you know, the flag, flagship uh, projects. Um, there's then uh, other areas that are deemed to be almost essential that we must do. Um, NDNA is also being mentioned then. Um, yes. Now, NDNA was unfunded. Mm -hmm. We didn't receive the funding for it all. So my question is, who is deciding that everything in NDNA, NDNA New Decade, New Deal, which uh, was unfunded becomes essential and that other essential things are not able to happen. So is that the minister's call or is that the executive's call? Um, 
That, that really is um, in terms of the executive, you know, and, and NDNA has a number of different levels of commitment. So there's executive commitment, there's, there's UK government commitment, there's Irish government commitments too. But it's unfunded. So, well, not, there, there, there is money coming for some of it. Um, so that's where I think, you know, it's important that we say, look, this is an NDNA commitment and therefore should be, should be seen as a priority because that is an international commitment. Can you help us providing a, a, a list of what NDNA funding uh, has been committed to mm -hmm. uh, and what has not? Because I, I, I just I, I was un, I was unaware that uh, there was specific funding yeah. for everything that was mentioned in the well, NDNA. One example would be the low emission buses, yeah, um, which is an NDNA commitment, and the money has been committed. Where's the money coming from? Um, Part of it is from the budget, um, and I believe that there is also money coming from the UK government. Terry, can you confirm that? Yes, I can, Linda. That, uh, that NDNA for low emission buses was a, a direct amount allocated over and above our normal departmental allocations. But, but my question specifically is, uh, everything listed under NDNA uh, has it all been funded by additional resources or are we committing some other capital resources which in normal times we would not have prioritised for uh, towards them even though they were unfunded? Well, I suppose uh, the answer the is... Mr. Buss is the only thing that's been funded but of, of those other things under NDNA, those are also ministerial priorities. A1 junctions, uh, Newry Southern Relief Road, Yep. Uh, York's my, my, narrow, specific, not water my, pitch. my specific question was, were there minister, ministerial decisions to prioritise NDNA expenditure over other issues? Is that a minister's decision? Because it's unfunded. I think the point we should be making is that none of, none of this is committed yet because it's all bids. You know, where we are in a bidding process. But were they explained in your document yeah. as being... Uh, 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 essential. Um, trying yeah. to get the right wording. And, and I think, I think, you know, in terms of what inescapable is yeah. the wording used. In terms of inescapable, I mean, that has to include, you know, the flagships, which are executive commitments, mm -hmm. and DNA, which are, you know, commitments from from one of three governments, um, and then anything that's contractually committed. Yeah. So I mean, if, if someone else is paying for it, uh, let them pay for it, but are yeah. we committing some of our money towards it, which which was not originally yeah. earmarked for it? That's yeah. that's but, essentially yeah, what and, I'm saying. And that's where I suppose there are unknown, ongoing negotiations between um, the executive and both the British and Irish governments okay. um, on, on elements of it. So I, I'm sorry, I can't be specific about all of the bids okay. and where they're coming from. The, the one that we are certain about is, is the low emission buses. Okay, one final brief question then is uh, one of the, the uh, lines in the uh, bid for 21-22, uh, sorry, 20, is it 21 or 20, is it? Yeah, um, is um, under the heading of uh, uh, replacement connecting Europe facility funding, uh, 55 million. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate what, what exactly that is? Yes, so that is um, a bid to, um, again, replace EU funds that have been lost because we are now out of the EU. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Kelly. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think there's any getting away from the cost of Brexit, whether it's a, a direct cost or a financial loss to us. But, um, Chair, the, uh, the opening remarks, I think, from um, uh, Mr. Boylan uh, in relation to uh, gridding and potholes is something I have a, a lot of sympathy with, but I did feel a bit like it was a council meeting I was at and starting to raise some of the issues. However, um, Mr. Buchanan and his contribution raised the, the point about um, if there's small amounts of money left over, people at local level are telling us that they can spend it. However, uh, is the question then around the procurement processes um, that uh, because the same uh, argument to some extent is uh, is within education where there should be some level of flexibility to principals around being able to uh, procure uh, small maintenance 
uh, tasks within school premises and facilities. So I just wonder, are there any lessons to be learned or anything to be shared with finance around uh, procurement methodologies without uh, falling foul of any um, overly creative uh, practices which might lead to uh, uh, put at risk uh, some of the uh, recommendations that we now uh, all want to and all should have wanted to abide by under RHI. Uh, that's one. And I noticed a recurrent theme was also around staffing. And I've been around long enough to know that uh, infrastructure and previously regional development was cut to the quick over many years by successive executives, as well as um, the uh, staffing issue, uh, where uh, someone mentioned about the voluntary exit scheme and several staff have left, and now we see recruitment uh, partly for to fix the uh, and to develop the NDA elements of uh, the um, program. But uh, I, I would like to know. In terms of comparison, say, from the best time in terms of road service staffing, whether at departmental level or down throughout the regions, uh, whether or not um, uh, we could have any comparison or any indication about the ongoing shortfall in terms of workforce and where the workforce planning then um, is enabled, I said, in moving forward and in, in, in actually being able to deliver a number of the projects that are currently uh, on, uh, before us here. Yeah, I mean, you, you are right. Um, you know, I, I know my colleague An An Andrew Murray um, will say that, you know, he has lost a considerable number of staff over over the past <coughs> four or five years. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure he would be able to provide you with, um, you know, a running total of staff numbers, um, but they have gone down considerably um, in the past five years. And there's no doubt about that. Um, and that does impact then on our ability to deliver as a department. <coughs> uh, do you think it might be useful to have some sort of insight into the staffing difficulties across the department? I know that the voluntary exit scheme, um, a significant number of experienced personnel took the opportunity and left. Uh, and I think we are feeling uh, the after effects of that. Uh, so that might be useful just uh, to, ha to have that knowledge before us. Uh, the other thing, Chair, I didn't want to really want to get into old arguments, you know, but other people did bring them up. And I think it'd be fair to say that in relation to uh, the varies that the infrastructure department has, uh, was something that was agreed uh, at the executive before uh, for the minister uh, uh, of infrastructure to bring forward a bid. And at the end of the day, finance and economy uh, departments still remain uh, the responsible uh, departments in relation to uh, the financial support packages. And what we have been overseeing is picking up the slack where there have been particular um, uh, difficulties faced by elements uh, within different sectors in the round um, uh, the cost of overheads and PPE, etc. So I just don't think it's fair to continue to mix up and attempt to confuse and make political gain out of what are very dire circumstances for individuals who are trying to navigate around various support packages. Okay. Any, have you any other question? No, thank you. Any members, anything further? Sure, I just want to clear up one point because Ms Kelly raised there. Um, BFA is responsible for roads, not yes. council. Not council. The money comes out of the grants here. Miss Kelly said she thought she was at a council meeting. See, that's the confusion that reigns on the ground. That's why people are confusing the message. Mm. The budget's given out of here to fix it. And the reason why I brought up some of those issues today is because the message coming out of here will be money was handed back. Does not matter capital or resource? Anybody listening, the general public doesn't understand mm -hmm. that all they want is the roads fixed. But just to remind yeah. people, it's DFA's responsibility for roads, not council. No, you're absolutely you know right. I mean, they may engage with councils, which is 100%, yeah. and they're rightly so. Yeah. They may report once or twice a year, you have an update, but it's DFA's responsibility. Thank you, Chair. Can I just go back to one more point just within the January monitoring paper? And it's in relation to the spending profile of the planning portal project has been revised, resulting in a reduced requirement of 0.6 million. Was that a change in the classification of that? Was there an overestimate of the cost of the project? Could you maybe just um, 
give a little bit more information just with regards to that. This is maybe not a highly political point, but it was just yeah. for clarification, please. It is really just a timing difference. So the revised payment schedule has been agreed with the contractor. So there will be new milestones that will be agreed, and those payments will be tied to those new milestones rather than what we had originally forecasted on. So it is purely just a timing difference, and that will be picked up then in future financial years. Okay, so the costs is the same. It's just one. I think there's spent. a small there's a small overall saving as well actually built into the new milestones as well, a small amount of savings, which will be shared between the department and the councils. Okay, no, that, that's great. Well, thank you. Um, I don't have any further questions. You'll be delighted to hear. And I don't think anyone else has indicated. So thank you um, all for coming this morning. And thank you. No doubt we will see you in the not too distant future. Thank yep. you. Thank you very much. There were a couple of points we just have to explore a little bit further with regards to um, the issue around chemicals for Northern Ireland water and getting some clarification around that. Also, um, staffing. Yeah. Um, we, I, we, we will have to um, get a briefing um, quite soon from the um, road section, so Andrew Murray then could maybe address some of those issues that he's um, experiencing with staff. Um, but also around the points which were made around winter gridding, um, there were a number of members picked that up, and obviously the structural maintenance side of things as well, which hasn't been covered in a, in a little bit of time um, since we came back. So um, that would be that would be useful to do, um, and also then commentary from the minister around the A5. I think was something which Miss Anderson had um, requested. So I think that's more or less it covered, isn't it? So. Sure. And um, the road safety aspect as well, particularly around the grants. You have made a point there in relation to COVID, not going away too soon, it's with us for a while. But there is working practices whereby there are difficulties in some depots where um, two people not work together, uh, crews will not go out in the same farm, will not put sign each up because it takes two men to put the sign each other. So some areas are dependent on contractors. Better working practices, as you say, for more sustainable working. Okay, and well, I suppose on, on that point, and I'm going back a number of years whenever I had visited some of the section offices, and some of the conditions that those. Um, workers were, were working in and that was even sort of regards to some of the, the office areas that they were and you know some of them at that stage were complaining about no hot water and so on as well and I suppose it would be quite interesting if we could get a report back just on that type of estate um, and that is just basically at, at ground level um, and just making sure that that everything is up to a standard given where we are around um, COVID and, and it is much more than just um, PPE and gloves and so on too it's about making sure that the facilities are at, are at an appropriate standard. So if we could maybe just um, request an update with regards to that and, and whether there is some um, money required for that type of work. Okay, um, anything else members picked up from that that they would like further explored? No, okay. Moving then on to our next briefing. Um, the Taxi Financial Assistance Scheme, and that's at page 351, um, Hansard the meeting, and obviously quite a bit of this has obviously been discussed um, in the previous session as well. Um, so we we'll welcome um, Julie Thompson, who is the Deputy Secretary of Planning, Safety and Transport Policy Group, and we have Beverly Cowan, um, Head of Driving Policy, who is coming to the meeting via Starleaf. Uh, you're both very welcome. Um, it's good okay. to see you. Um, and Julie, I understand that you're going to um, make an opening statement and then members will follow up with some questions. No problem. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity, obviously, to come along today and give you an update on the Department's provision of financial assistance for the taxi sector. Um, as well as several responses over recent months from the Department to the Committee in, in, um, on the issue. In advance of today, we obviously gave you a written briefing which set out the background to the scheme and various issues around it. And now, I guess, I just want to give you an update on the scheme and where we're at um, with it and plans for a second scheme for taxi drivers. 
Uh, so looking at taxi drivers first, um, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to cause a significant and long-lasting impact right across our businesses and communities, and that includes taxis. In recognition of the challenges faced, the Minister acts swiftly at the outset of the pandemic to put in place a number of regular easements, such as automatic licences, amounting to over a million pounds of support. In addition, when new powers were granted to the Department by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister on the 3rd of November, the Minister opened the Taxi Driver Financial Assistance Scheme on the 13th of November and it closed on the 27th of November. As you all know, the scheme was agreed by the Executive and was designed to provide a contribution to overhead costs, including PPE, that had been incurred as a result of the COVID pandemic. It is in addition to all the other financial support provided to taxi drivers and indeed all self-employed workers through the self-employment income support schemes and the newly self-employed schemes in particular. In order to, to ensure value for money, the scheme was dependent on actual expenses having been incurred during the period 22nd of March up to 30th of September. Taxi drivers who had evidence of continuous insurance were eligible for the payment of £1,500. And that was based on feedback from the sector on their overheads and that the most significant overhead that they incurred was insurance. In terms of scheme update, a total of 4,582 applications were assessed for eligibility. In just over three weeks following the scheme closure, 3,500 applications were processed to payment prior to Christmas. That equates to almost 5.3 million and was over 76% of the applications submitted. And that was the position whenever we gave you the briefing paper. We are very aware that taxi drivers needed their payments urgently. Staff continued to request information, sought clarification, and resolve the issues on the remaining applications. And by the end of today, we expect that the final payments to all ap applicants will have been issued and they will bring the total payments to over 4,000 at a cost of some over £6 million. That is some 87% of the applications submitted. The notification letters to the unsuccessful applicants of the current scheme will also be issued this week and at the same time they will be advised about the second scheme that I'll come on to shortly. Um, as an update from the briefing paper, the current analysis of applicants' data indicates that almost 13% of applicants fail to meet the continuous insurance eligibility test. They failed for a number of reasons. For example, they took a break in their continuous insurance or reduced it to social, domestic and pleasure for part of the six months and for understandable reasons in order potentially for the lack of trade and to save themselves money. Others may not have applied to the scheme at all given their lack of continuous insurance or because they have left the taxi industry. As the first scheme was wrapped up, the Minister has recognised and is very sympathetic to the fact that while some of those drivers did not have continuous insurance, they, they still incurred a proportion of the costs which were not covered by other schemes. She is also mindful that the current and ongoing restrictions continue to impact on the taxi drivers financially, making it difficult for them to cover the costs that they continue to incur. And for those reasons, last week the Minister announced her intention to bring forward a further financial assistance scheme for taxi drivers, which is subject to executive agreement and First Minister Deputy First Agreement of a further determination and designation. I'd like to take a few minutes just to outline the principles of that new scheme, because I'm conscious that's completely new and wasn't in your briefing pack um, uh, that was provided to you. Uh, members will also wish to note that the Minister met with the sector representatives on Monday as part of the plans for, on the development of this, of this second scheme. So given the ongoing restrictions impacting on the taxi trade and the gaps in the existing schemes for taxi drivers, the proposed scheme is consistent with the policy intention of the first scheme. This will go to the executive, or is intended to go to the executive for discussion tomorrow. Um, and an executive paper is already issued in draft to executive colleagues. The second scheme would run for a 12-month period from the 22nd of March until, uh, 2020 until the 21st of March 2021. It would be open to applicants who have either continuous or partial insurance throughout the entire 12-month period, thereby capturing applicants who were not eligible for the current scheme, but also capturing drivers for, the, for this new period from the 1st of October to the 21st of March. It's based on the same principles about sector evidence around provision of uh, insurance details. Payments will be based, however, on a pro rata basis in order to deal with the issue of partial insurance. 
So to reflect the variation in costs incurred amongst drivers, it is a proposed that £250 would be paid for every 30 days of full insurance, up to a maximum of £3,000. So just to give you an example, um, that would mean that a driver had met, fully met the criteria and had already been paid £1,500 from the existing scheme would be eligible for a maximum support of up to £3,000 for the total 12 months. They would have already received £1,500. They would receive £1,500 from the second scheme. But if perhaps somebody had not applied and were now applying for the first time, we'll work that out based on how many days of, of insurance that they have incurred expense for from the start of the year. The maximum payment of £3,000, as you're aware, is reflective of the analysis provided by the sector and confirmed by our departmental information. The details of the scheme will go to the executive and um, subject to their approval. The designation needs to be provided by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister under the powers of the Financial Assistance Act and the SL1 will then come to the committee if all of that goes well and that could be next week. So I guess just alerting to you to that possibility for, for next week's agenda. The regulations will need finalised and it would be expected to launch the scheme by early February. Uh, in terms of improvements, given the thousands of emails and related correspondence that we have received for the first scheme, further consideration has been given as to how applicants can track an update on their application and at the same time not divert staff away from the processing and urgent issue of payments. And while not all of the COVID uh, support schemes have telephone contacts, we're looking to see if we can put in a phone line this time for the future scheme. The committee has also asked about taxi operators um, and why they weren't excluded from the, the scheme. As part of this stakeholder engagement process, Minister and officials have held a number of meetings with taxi operators and that includes them at the meeting on Monday. A bespoke scheme has not been set up for the operators given that they can avail of existing financial support such as business support grants, loan schemes, VAT deferrals, rates relief, furlough of staff. Taxi operators also advise that providing financial support to drivers would provide indirect support to them by helping taxi drivers remain in business. However, the Minister continues to press for the inclusion of the taxi sector in the DFE-led schemes, particularly Part B of the Coronavirus Restrictions Business Support Scheme. Officials have liaised with DFE in order to establish uh, whether taxi operators are eligible, which they have confirmed. Um, and during the meeting on Monday, it was clear that some taxi operators were not aware of this, and we have then advised them of the link to the scheme in order to try and increase awareness that they should be applying to that scheme. There's obviously a range of eligibility criteria for that scheme uh, that they must meet as well. Their minister remains fundamentally of the view that the executive needs to take an inclusive and fair approach to the financial support provided for the restrictions through the DFE scheme and that all businesses that are eligible to apply should be able to do so. In conclusion, we recognise that this is an exceptionally challenging time for all businesses and workers and we are working to provide valuable support alongside all the other schemes which are available across the executive and government. And obviously Beverly or I are happy to take your questions and provide answers. Okay, um, so no, thank you very much for that and obviously appreciate the time um, prior to Christmas when you met with myself and um, the Deputy Chair, although it was disappointing that um, no one could come to the committee um, at the earlier stage um, um, to discuss, I suppose, the difficulties that were very real at that particular time as we were heading into Christmas and a substantial number of uh, drivers still at that stage had not received any um, support. Um, I do welcome um, the, um, the comments in relation to the, the new scheme which is being devised and obviously lessons are being learned around um, communication because that has been something which has been really, really difficult and all members will have had um, numerous taxi drivers um, and come to them and as, I mean I, I know that from experience over the last few days and obviously have communicated that with um, the department. Um, so the ability to be able to track an application um, is certain and certainly welcome. Um, and obviously also the recognition that the costs have continued for those drivers um, during this time and it, it isn't getting any better for them. Um, and I suppose although we're, we're looking towards the vaccine and, and trying to bring confidence back to um, the community um, within the next number of weeks, it's still going to take quite some considerable time 
in order for um, services that we've become very reliant on and very used to um, for them to get back to um, some level of normality given um, the lack of prospect I suppose, of hospitality um, opening up um, in the foreseeable future. Um, with regards to the, the monies then that um, are available, obviously there was a £14 million um, set aside for the scheme and you've said there today that it's around £6 million which has been spent. Um, what is your estimate then for the cost of the um, revised scheme? So we estimate the revised scheme will cost around £10 million. It's quite difficult to estimate because we're not sure exactly what the take-up will be, uh, particularly if, if taxi drivers have, have left the industry, and that's difficult to, to work out. But based on £6 million that's already been incurred for the first six months, taking a second six months in and allowing a, a, an estimate around the numbers who um, will come in through now because of the partial insurance that didn't meet the, the original, we reckon it'll be about £10 million. So that would be £16 million then in total for taxis across the two schemes. Okay, and obviously the d delivery of that element of the scheme will be quicker because of the majority, although I know and I appreciate that there will have been those who won't have applied prior to that, um, will be new applicants to you. But um, for the main cohort who have applied, um, they should receive money subject to um, things being in place very quickly? It depends on when that what their insurance was, was doing, I guess. So we will need to, because we haven't looked at the period from the 1st of October to March of, of this year, we still need that evidence data around what they have done in those six months. So we will need to um, look at that. We want to work with the sector to establish whether it's easier just to, if you like, look at the entire year and take off a £1,500 if you've already received it, or whether we're better just to look at the six months and leave the original six months. It really will depend on when people's taxi uh, renewals came through, their insurance renewals. Um, and we know from this first time that matching things has been very difficult just because of the sheer numbers. Now, we're obviously looking at the IT aspects of that, and, and Beverly could potentially talk a bit about that. But um, we, we are recognising that we need to get this matching business as, qu as quickly and as automated as possible. Um, but it has proved quite challenging to do just with the sheer numbers involved and with a lot of emails coming in, obviously, to the email account. So we are going to meet with the sector to establish what is the best way operationally of doing that from both our perspective and theirs um, to try and reduce the time if we possibly can. Okay. Beverly, is there anything you want to add to that? We can't hear you, Beverly, sorry. Mute. 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 Can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Do you want? I don't. Joyce. She's doing some. Had to find the button, right? I normally hear her. Hmm. No, we still no. can't hear you. You shouldn't have a problem. <laughs> mm. Survive. Okay. Julie, do you want us to continue? Yeah, Sorry, no, no, Beverly. Keep, keep, keep going. Um, uh, Beverly, can you maybe try and find out what's wrong and I'll keep going? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> It has been working. I mean, she um, normally I would be able to hear her with no problem, um, but I think it's the first time that she's used Starleaf. She was practicing yesterday, though. Okay, so obviously the um, the from the papers we were aware that um, there was 25 million set aside for for these schemes, um, and the 19 million then was allocated, 14 for um, taxis, and then five for coach operators. Um, so this is is likely then to take you over that 14 million, um, but obviously from the indications that we're being given that it, it should be easy to 
um, receive any top up that's required? It should be fairly well, straightforward. Yeah, the, the assumption is that we will need access to, as you say, we've only got 19 at the minute and we will need to obviously access more than that from the centre. There's a further 6 million sitting at the centre with the, that um, sort of ring fenced, I guess, for the sectors. Um, and that would be the first call to get us up to the 25. So our supposition is that this scheme would can be funded from within that 25 million. Okay, and just in, in hindsight, um, you, you said that the, obviously the sector hadn't um, informed you at the time that there may have been a significant number of drivers who may not have been able to qualify for sort of the continuous, cri continuous insurance criteria. I mean, had you been aware of that, may this been a different scheme from the outset? Difficult to know. I guess it's possible the more information you have about schemes, the more you can assess that. Um, but um, I think if we had been fully aware of the extent of the of the issue, then yes, we would have been able to do something potentially about it. Um, once the regulations and whatever were signed, then we obviously had to proceed, and the quickest thing to do was to proceed on the scheme that we've got. What we have managed to look at, though, is that rather than putting in like um, two new schemes, one for fully um, covered drivers and one for partially covered drivers, we're looking at one scheme that will encompass all of those and which will go forward over the next um, six months. So from that point of view, we, we've ended up with two schemes. And given that we were always going to have to look potentially at this period, October to, to March, uh, given what has happened, we would have ended up with two schemes, I'm pretty sure, anyway. Um, it's just the design of them is slightly different. Okay, so then just move, moving then on to the taxi operators, and, and you'll be aware of the presentation that they gave to us a, a number of weeks ago, and there have been subsequent requests for, for meetings um, with the department and, and those representatives. And, and while I appreciate there was a, a discussion um, at the beginning of the week, but that was primarily in relation to this new scheme as opposed to, and to keep them informed of that, as opposed to actually looking at something um, bespoke for for, for taxi operators and I mean undoubtedly they are incredibly disappointed as to um, sort of the lack of any progress around a scheme and I know that you've referred to other benefits that they may be or may not be eligible for um, particularly around um, part B um, of the, the scheme being run by um, the economy but again not all operators will be able to, to meet the criteria of that and anecdotally, we are aware of um, a number of operators who either have now closed their businesses or their businesses are going to be no longer sustainable within a number of weeks. Um, and there's a knock-on effect for drivers as a consequence of that as well. And you, you will be aware from the presentation that they gave that um, the support that the operators have been given and have been giving to um, drivers on an ongoing basis is probably um, quite extensive um, and during that particular time, particularly around rentals and so on as well. Um, now, you did refer to the fact that only two, um, two operators have applied for the economy scheme. And a number of reasons really around that will be one because they didn't know that some of them will not know that they could have been eligible for it, um, but the other one will be because they've been holding out for um, a scheme from from the department um, as per um, the indication that was given um, at the time that schemes were being drafted. Um, now, we have a number of schemes which will still be coming out from, um, the, from economy around hospitality and so on, um, which are above and beyond the schemes which are already in place for, for which they can avail of, but yet taxi drivers still will not be able to have a scheme that's focused, or taxi operators won't have a scheme which is focused on them. Is there any consideration, serious consideration being given by the department to look at a scheme for taxi operators? Um, I, I guess the circumstance of the taxi operators, whenever Minister moved in uh, late October around the taxi drivers, um, there was no request at that point around taxi operators um, and the focus of the scheme, as you know, was on taxi drivers and that was based on the evidence that had been provided to us around the support that they had already been given. At that point then the uh, coronavirus, the, the DFE scheme was coming into fruition and Part B in particular and the broadening of that scope to those businesses that are dependent on the businesses that have closed in order to run their business and being able to demonstrate a 40% reduction in turnover because of the closures. 
Now, as to why only two applied to, to the original scheme, I think there has been, it was pretty clear in Monday's meeting, that there was a lack of awareness between the around the operators generally about um, the access to that scheme, which would help them to um, you know, meet some of their, their financial costs moving forward. Um, and that, that the business support, obviously, that I've already talked about, that they were able to avail equally at the start of the year. So <coughs> that's the view of where we are at with taxi operators. And we're keen, obviously, that they in, that the awareness is increased around their ability to access the Part B scheme um, that will cover them for the restrictions and that they put in applications um, and hopefully get more success on those applications. Yeah, but given the fact that there was ongoing discussions in relation to the sector, um, did the department not feel that perhaps that they should have been clearer in relation to you know, what they were planning to do and how or not they were going to be able to support operators, um, given the fact that they were holding out then for a scheme for themselves? Well, we, ha we have been clear that we've been providing support for taxi drivers, and that's what went to the executive. That's what was announced in the press. We, we haven't announced at any point a, a scheme for taxi operators. Um, so that's been the case since October. And obviously, yes, there is definitely an issue about their awareness around the Part B scheme for the DFE. And in fact, obviously, the minister would prefer even more um, businesses able to access that. But for the moment, we've definitely need to increase their awareness that they can access to that scheme, and uh, which can give you know 400 to 800 pounds per week per property to eligible businesses. So it's a substantial amount of money. Okay, but again, not all of them will be able to meet that criteria either. But I mean, could I ask that? Um, and I appreciate that there was a, a, a sort of a more of a roundtable discussion um, um, in the last couple of days, but that um, that you do meet the operators directly just to discuss their particular circumstances um, and to see whether or not there is something that you can either do for them or certainly give advice as to what they need to do. The outcome of the meeting on Monday because the operator scheme was discussed or, or the lack of an operator scheme was discussed on Monday and the outcome of the meeting was uh, an agreement that our minister would uh, make contact with the minister for the economy and establish whether there was a possibility of doing a meeting jointly uh, with the operators and with the, with the ministers. Okay, and, and obviously recognising the vast number of schemes which are, are, are going through economy and obviously the, the pressures that they are obviously experiencing as well. Um, you know, is there any willingness within the department to, if there is a discussion that perhaps there is an opportunity to give some support to operators that the Department for Infrastructure will step up in order to assist with that? Well, at the moment, we have no plans to introduce a taxi operator scheme at this stage. And as I say, the outcome from, from the discussions was to have a conversation with the Minister for the Economy about the scheme that she has already in place. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and you're very welcome, Tilly and Palmerly. Just to clarify the point, because I mean, from an MLA's perspective, if if the operators come to us and ask for advice, I'm saying to you, Julie, so what will we be saying them? We're saying it's going to be a meeting between the two ministers and the operators. I mean, what about those people who haven't engaged? Yeah. I mean, how do we get that message out? You know, yes. Because it's important, and and I think we should be looking at the scheme. To be honest with you. Because, I mean, it, it, these schemes are well advertised out around. We, as, as, as members, try to get it out to as many people as possible. Clearly, some of them didn't realise that. But, but, but I, think, I think the operators we should be looking at some scheme to try and facilitate them. But just in terms of how we get a message out now to the operators, because I know some has contacted me and Liz and we listened to it. So what's, what's the message? Sorry. OK, no, I just want to... We can actually hear Beverly now. Oh, yeah. Um, but the fact that um, she's not on mute, that we can actually hear everything that she's saying. <laughs> so, um, just Beverly, if you'd like to mute, and then we'll call you back in again. I am. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why. I think everyone muted. But I'll give it another go. OK, no problem. Volume <laughs> up. Um, I, I guess the message to all operators, there's a couple of messages to all operators. Um, one is that they need to be made aware, obviously, that they can apply for Part B. They need to meet the criteria, absolutely, of that scheme, but the option is there for them to do that. And we definitely think, for, uh, following Monday's meeting, that there has been a lack of awareness of that. So that's that's one of the issues. I guess then, around more generally, um, then 
the outcome of Monday's meeting was that uh, contact we made with Minister for Economy about then uh, taxi operators, um, and that that meeting obviously, um, uh, you know, will need to obviously be set up. Private offices and whatever would need to be in contact and establish what can happen there. So that's the, the next thing that would happen. But at the moment, there's no plans for a DFI taxi <coughs> operator scheme. Right, and just the, the issue of additional powers or powers. Has, has the minister or does the minister require additional powers? Yes, she does. Um, because the original powers um, were for a scheme, um, we've looked at that legally and therefore we need to go and, and the, the going to the executive and back to um, First Minister and Deputy First Minister, we have to go back and get powers again, even though it's, a, it's another scheme for taxi drivers. So um, the, the short answer to your question is yes, we need more powers to be given to us because they were only given to us for the operation of the scheme that we've currently run and finished. So to get to, to run any new scheme um, under the Financial Assistance Act, we need to go back to the executive and back to uh, First Minister and Deputy First Minister, which we fully intend to do. Okay, and, and just clarify the point then. See the SL1 you're bringing this is for this new scheme, yeah? Yes. Right, and it, it'll identify. And that will be dependent on. I guess for, for your own scheduling, it will be dependent on the executive committee discussions and obviously then on the FM, DFM designation timeframes and whatever. But if everything ran smoothly, there's a potential for that SL1 to be with the committee next week um, and then move on from there. Okay, and just a couple of quick points then, because clearly those people who took an insurance break are the ones that now, see in terms of the first scheme, when is it, is it officially finished now? or? Yes, it closed on the 27th of November. Right, so. okay. See, you were saying there are 13% of them didn't. Were all those people who, in the, the uh, under the criteria, the, the insurance break, those 13%? Um, it's where, Beverly, maybe I will bring you in on this. It, it's either where they've had maybe partial insurance or they maybe even had no insurance at all, would have put an application in. Is there anything else you want to add about the rejections? <laughs> No, that's it. Um, in terms of the insurance, Cahill, it would be those reasons that Julia has mentioned. There would be some other reasons as well where they didn't um, or weren't affiliated to uh, an operator's license or they didn't have a valid um, driver license either. But in the main, um, it's where they didn't have the, the full insurance. They didn't meet that criteria. Right. We also did get quite a few of duplicates applications and applications from uh, Great Britain, from England, Scotland and Wales. <laughs> so uh, those have been rejected as well. Right, well, well just no one appreciate um, the The issue for us now is then, see the ones who are still waiting on confirmation. Uh, uh, there's people still waiting on confirmation, right? Do you have asked for extra evidence in terms of the insurance? Uh, those people are now going to be facilitated. The majority of those people who can provide the evidence in terms of the insurance break will now be facilitated pro rata, is that what you're saying? That's exactly right, Cahill, very much so. So that um, we will, this week, we'll see us close out the, the final um, final payments on the closed scheme, issue the rejection letters then to those that haven't been successful, point people to the fact there's a new scheme coming, and that will address, we expect, virtually, all, I, can't, I can't guarantee all, but certainly the vast, vast bulk of those that fell out and were rejected from this particular scheme. And the pro rata, so you get £250 for every 30 days. Again, because we looked at months originally, but then insurances don't always operate on a start month and an end month and whatever. So we're going for a 30-day block, whatever that block may be, and ratchet it up. If you've got 60 days, you'll get £500, etc., etc. Um, and when does that go back to? Or is it goes right back to the start, start, of, okay. start to the 20, 22nd of March. So we'll pick up backwards and forwards, which is why I was saying to the chair, in one scheme, we can go, we can go both forwards and backwards. The one issue we are looking at is because the scheme will open um, at the summer, early February. Um, we won't be able, you know, we won't have evidence between February and then the, because the, this will be a scheme running effectively to March 2021. So there's a little bit of an issue around what do we do with those last few weeks. But assuming we can find a way around that, then um, it's one scheme that operates right the way through. 
So, so you're saying you have to amend the scheme through an SL1 to facilitate those? We do, yes. Okay. Uh, a new regula- all of that all. So new, designa- new executive paper, new designation, new SL1, new regs, all needed to be done because the well, if you think the detail of the scheme is different is, uh, from, what, from what we've already had approval for. Okay, and finally, Chair, you will add here. In terms of the numbers, what did you say, 4,800 to play? 4,500 odd, 4,582. And what potentially on the new scheme, what do you think, how many do you think potentially could do? Well, I get that's, that's slightly challenging because um, you've got combinations of, if you assume those 4,582, if they had continuous insurance for the first six months, are likely to still have, and I, I use that term likely, to still have continuous insurance moving forward. Um, and then for the remainder, we're looking at um, picking up people who fell out this time. Um, so the, the, the 13% odd that didn't work this time, and then multiplying that back through, which is where we've got to the, the £10 million. Pounds. So um, it is quite challenging because you, for every person that applies, you've got a range of options now. So the last time it was quite difficult, oh, sorry, quite easy to quantify. This time for every person that applies, they could be applying for one month or they could be applying for 12. And there, that's that's where we've come up with the 10 million pounds as, a, as a, a, what we estimate at this stage. But it could go higher, it could go lower, depending on, on what uptake is like. It's highly unlikely that all 9,000 um, currently, like we, we understand that. So it'll be a number lower than that. But to what extent it is lower, we, it's difficult to know. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The Deputy Chair, Mr. Hildage. Thanks, sir. Uh, welcome, very welcome. Julie, you're starting to sound like Bruce Forsyth. Or higher, lower, lower, oh. higher. <laughs> I thought it was a game show. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is obviously issues that will have to be communicated from today's meeting on from whatever the executive agree the process. Am I right in saying, in a very clear yes or no, that people who have already been paid out of the first scheme can also be paid out of the second scheme? Very because I've been yes. asked that question a number of times, mostly by those, I have to say, who haven't been paid yet, okay. <laughs> or uh, that didn't make it on that first scheme. So they'll have another bite of the cherry, those who have already been paid then. And that applies whether you were successful or unsuccessful. So if you were successful in the first scheme, you'll have got £1,500 paying mm-hmm. you up to the 30th of September. Yeah. So that person can apply and get the money for the second six months, assuming that they still have insurance in place. For those that were unsuccessful because they had partial insurance, we will pick those. If they reapply, that will work for whatever the time frame they have insurance for right the way through from March last year through to March this year. And that we'll work it out in, on 30 day blocks. So it, it's, it's depe- it then will become scalable, I guess, to the individual circumstances of the taxi drivers. And that's going to cause us to, uh, the chair was answering, asking, could we do it quicker? That bit, that element makes it slightly slower because it is more complicated. So we're looking to see how we speed that up. But that's, uh, I guess, something we haven't done before, so we, I'm just a yeah, little bit cautious about it. Yeah, because some of these folk have received nothing, as you know. I've never... It, this has been the one, one of the biggest things for my office anyway, has, like the chair has been the taxi driver. It's been phenomenal. It really has. And to listen to their stories, some of them are heartbreaking because of the long hours that they work. Potentially, they're like with kids in the house, and they're the only breadwinner in the house because, obviously, they do long hours. So you can guess that some of the stories that you've had to, we've had to listen to have been very, very difficult for the people to tell us about them and the difficulties that they're in. So hopefully there's some light at, at the end of the tunnel. But there are also those who have didn't renew insurance for long periods of time because they were them. And again, they didn't have any extra income for that. They had no income, basically, for that. So again, the insurance element's going to do those guys out of getting something uh, towards... Um, I, I guess, to your first point, we, we fully recognise the challenge that this, has, that this is and, that, and we've also had an awful lot of correspondence about, about that from taxi drivers. Um, that's part of the reason or the f- reason why we couldn't come the, the last time, because the guys were, were, were um, 
really working hard to get as many payments out, particularly before <coughs> Christmas, that we possibly could. Um, the ones after Christmas have, have had various issues that needed to be matched or, or worked through on them. Um, but this week, I guess your message back to taxi drivers should be that this week will close all of that out. Um, in terms of those that are, are shielding, because this is a scheme that is about um, support for overhead payments, um, then you have to have incurred those overhead payments in order to, to get funding from the scheme. But some of them will have, you know, some of them shielded from March to September, say, couldn't, had to get back in the earn a crust at the yes. end of the day, so we're back in and had to get that stuff, but still because of were shielding, there's nothing to cover them for that period of time. Uh, and, and that's where I was going to say, where, where other schemes then fit in, I mean, the, our scheme, DFI schemes, fits in alongside the other schemes that are available, so the, the SES scheme, the self-employment scheme, the newly self-employed scheme, isolation grants, there's a re obviously a range of other supports that are available, and we know that taxi drivers did avail of those, um, um, and, and that self-employed scheme in particular has then been extended by government through and, and runs up, um, it's now back up to 80% of profits again, uh, based on your previous year. So that, that those schemes are still available, whether shielding or not. Yeah. No, it's just it's been, it's been a disappointing time. I think communication has played a big part in it too, and maybe sort of the, the lag of it. And I'm delighted to hear that you have a designated phone plan. Is that right? A phone plan? Well, we haven't um, yet, but we're we're looking to, to get yeah, one in we'll, place. Hope, hopefully um, that works yes, out. Yes, we're, we're hoping that... We, not all of the schemes have them, um, but some of them do, and we're hoping we can learn from that. Okay, on the operator stroke depots, you know, when you were taking this on, did you not feel in your own mind that this was to be for the taxi industry per se, and it wasn't going to be split? But was that not something in the early stages that the department should have recognised? Instead of now we're in a situation where it's nearly them and us, um, and the drivers and the operators. In the early stages, yes, we, we gathered evidence from both uh, operators and drivers, and uh, the meetings have happened and indeed have continued to happen with both. Occasionally we've met with one, but we have run operator-only meetings, and we've run driver-only meetings, and we've done joint meetings. Yeah. Um, and the, the evidence has... Joint meetings, does yeah. that not give you, from an early stage, that it's a taxi industry... The Department of Infrastructure should have been looking after not just one part of it. Yeah, and we have we have looked at the evidence, I guess, that has been provided to us by the industry, uh, and we've had evidence provided both by drivers and by operators, um, and that demonstrated that the operators were able to access quite a range of financial assistance schemes um, that they've obviously talked to you, to you about as well. So it was from that that then from October we've been working on the driver's scheme and then obviously the second scheme for drivers now. But what seemed to be the blockage at part B of that particular fund that was getting people turned down? The part B explicitly says that taxi drivers are not allowed to access it as a very explicit no, exclusion. Like the, operators the operators can access it. Um, I think it, it sounded from Monday as if there was just a, a lot of lack, of, lack of yes, a lot of lack of awareness, and because they the, at the bottom of the scheme it talks about you know exclusion for taxi drivers. I think there's been an interpretation that that includes taxi operators, but we have talked to officials and they're That's they've it. advised <coughs> us that operators can apply. Um, so I, I think it has been a bit of a lack of awareness, to be honest. Um, so we, we, and obviously yourselves, can probably get the message out to operators that they are able to apply for that scheme. Right, okay. And I take it those 772 from other jurisdictions, then, were from mostly from the mainland. It's quite a high number. <laughs> it, it, it was a very high number. I think we're going to put Northern Ireland very, very strongly over the top of everything um, the next time. It was there, but I guess people potentially were just reaching out and thought they could apply. And of course, we're now in another lockdown situation as well, which started off with a curfew, probably what would be the busiest week of the taxi operators and depots year. So it is crucial that we get this communication and message out as best we can. And also just take the opportunity of thanking you and your staff for what you have done the ATM as well, because it has been quite an operation getting through all that work. And 
also expressed my concerns that staff were abused at times as well, uh, and that should never happen. And uh, just uh, sympathise with you on that as well. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And Beverly, if you can pass that back to the team, I think they really appreciate that. It has been very difficult for the staff. Very difficult. Thank you. Yeah, it was it was difficult actually to hear that um, that your staff were abused in the way that they were. And and while there's an appreciation that um, tension is high and people are very anxious, I don't think there's any call for to be rude or to be abusive at, at all. So. Um, I think that would be the sentiment really of all members of, of the committee just in relation to that, that that isn't acceptable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you. Um, you've obviously covered a lot of points. Just a couple of quick quick questions. So it's obviously a new application, it's not a rule off. Um, as I say, the actual details of how you will definitely need to apply again. Okay. Yes, yes. But we're working on the details about how exactly that will happen. Okay. Yes. So so if I applied last year, for example, as a taxi driver and I had no insurance. Okay, so therefore I, I got nothing based on that fact. So if the new system, a uh, new application process opens, therefore I need insurance obviously to apply. Yes. Okay, so what So at what point do you look back? So if I know now, say for example I know today there's a new scheme coming, I go out and get my insurance or upgrade my insurance today, do you look back on a certain timeline in that or purely that I have an insurance document? We'll be looking at the days that your insurance is applicable from and for. Uh, and we appreciate and one of the complications of this is that people have been putting their insurance up and down depending and that's, that's com completely understandable. So we're going to have to have uh, the ability on the application form to, for you to be able to record different time frames over the year about what, uh, what, what insurance you've actually had in place. So it could be on a month off. On a month off, which is why we've ended up going for the days because it, it, we already know from what we could see on this scheme that the, um, the ability to do it on anything else other than a daily basis was not going to work. It's, so, it's a very flexible scheme, but the exact workings out of it, we're still obviously working through. So if you equip 30 days, that's obviously a month there, thereabouts a month. So while you're on for two weeks and off for two weeks, you want a totality of 30 days to get you the £250. That's exactly right. And final question, uh, you see the 895 duplicate applications? Why were there so many duplicate applications? Yes, um, we're not sure is the simple answer to that. Um, some of them are twice, some of them are more than twice. Um, it may well be that people, and it may be partly because people couldn't uh, um, understand what had happened to their application, and maybe in the interests of, of just went again, exactly. Um, so that's one of the kind of things when we get everything closed out this week on all the payments and all the um, um, notifications of rejections back, we would intend then to look at those to see if there's any learning in those from, from for the next time. Um, and it's there's a way of, of blocking it, I guess, or, or reassure, reassure, it could be, you know, just simple reassurance that people needed that their application had gone and that there was nothing to worry about. So we so think it's a large portion to do with the connection of not being able to see your, your application moving it do, through. It doesn't concern you that obviously Joe Bloggs, for example, has applied three times, but that's purely because Joe Bloggs wasn't sure he had applied. It, it's very difficult to know why somebody did it. Um, I'm posing one reason why they might have done it. Um, we need to reflect about what, what we've definitely done is guarantee we're only, we've only issued a payment once. So that's, that's well taken care of. And obviously in terms of public money, that's exactly what we need to do. Um, I think we need to look to see whether we can in some way stop that happening again um, and, and making sure that it doesn't, if there is a way of doing that. Um, but the same taxi drives or times have different email addresses and that sort of thing. So um, it is something we intend to look at, absolutely. Okay. Uh, but I can, I can assure you that, you know, even on those duplicates, only one payment was issued. Thank you. Mr Beggs. <coughs> Again, just to thank yourselves and the Department of the Minister for reacting to the concern that was expressed from um, many taxi drivers and the sense of injustice that had occurred. Uh, being excluded perhaps because they had a two-week holiday and, and, and receiving the money. So I appreciate the fact that the department, your officials, yourself and the minister have, have responded to that. <clears throat> just just for clarification, uh, one other, um, uh, I'm thinking about another case, a taxi driver contacted me. They literally were ill the two weeks that the scheme was open. Can they now apply for the scheme which they were unable to apply for? 
Yes, they can, because by applying for the second scheme, because it's both working backwards yeah. and forwards, that will deal with all of that problem as well. I, I, I appreciate as I'm talking to you that obviously this is all subject to the executive agreement and, yeah. and all of that tomorrow, but um, um, if that all goes through, then yes. Yeah. And, and well, I, I, given the fact that it fixes many, fixes many injustices, I hope that the executive will promptly approve it and allow you and your officials to get on the process and get payments out. So, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I want to echo the words of other members in terms of thanks to the officials, to uh, Julian Beverly and all the staff members who have been involved in processing the grant applications and extremely grateful for that and it's been a significant volume um, and that's not what the department is designed for in terms of processing these applications um, but they've managed to turn them around so I'm, I'm very much um, grateful for that um, and also the ability in the future to be able to track the applications under what's hopefully going to be the second grant scheme I think that'll be useful in terms of reducing the volume of work uh, around that um, just Two things. Um, a lot of these questions have already been asked and answered, really, around the depots. I think we understand about the Part B, but just the issue is, is that the rateable premises for the taxi operators um, are largely quite small. So, as a result, the payments under that would be quite small because the rateable value of that would be low. So, I think it is an and a, a concern, and I wanted to note that in terms of the level of support for those operators that would be coming under the Part B. Uh, and the second one was just in relation to the first scheme, which is closed um, and that the payments are being finalised. Um, one of the issues around that was the requirement to have continuous insurance, and that was something that I know many of us were contacted around. And um, is the lack of a, a representative body? for the taxi industry, something that uh, would have helped in terms of identifying potential issues around that scheme. And if that's something that the department and, uh, can urge the establishment of something like that, which would allow then the department to engage with representatives throughout the whole sector. Yeah, I guess we, we have been liaising with taxi uh, representatives, both operators and drivers, and it's really been pretty much the same cohort the whole way through from, from September time. Um, they're very clear that they are representative of the sector, but don't necessarily represent the entirety of it, if you understand the distinction that, I, that I'm making. Um, now, that, that has, we've also then backed that up by, um, at key points, writing to everybody that we have on our database, um, whether they be operators or drivers, to, to advise them, and obviously using all mechanisms we can to make sure that people are alerted. But as Mr. Beggs has already pointed out, there are some people who potentially did miss the first scheme, um, and um, we're late, and obviously putting out the second scheme will, will help to, to address that, provided people know about it, provided they apply for it, and, and those same issues, I guess, again. Um, in terms of whether there should be a representative body um, or a more official body or whatever, I guess that's probably a matter for the sector to reflect on more so than us. Um, we're, we're using the mechanism that, that we have and can to, to engage with them. And as I say, we do supplement that. Um, and we did advise all um, everybody that we had in our database about the, about the first scheme. Um, and we will do that again, obviously, assuming that the scheme um, goes through and, and is running fine. That The continuous insurance issue um, did come up quite late in, in where we were at. The regulations had already been approved and we had to therefore proceed with what we have had. But I think in what we've done now in the second scheme, by only having one further scheme that has maybe dealt with the issue effectively, I appreciate there were a lot of disappointed people then who had that partial insurance, and that's the 13% uh, that unfortunately did not, um, weren't able to get money this time. But we'll sort that out the next time. Cheers. Okay, thank you, Ms. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Beverly, for your uh, for your update and your your input. Uh, Julie, just I wrote down what you said with regards to your um, intention to contact the TEO to the Joint First Ministers in relation to the powers. Um, I was a wee bit surprised at that because five days ago your minister had said that she had written to the, T the TEO asking for the powers. So when will you actually be writing to the Executive Office seeking the powers? We have written. 
Minister has written to the Executive Office seeking the powers and then subject to the Executive discussions tomorrow, we expect that um, the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, will be able to give us the powers, but that's obviously a matter for them, but the letter has already been issued. Do we know when it was issued? It was issued on Friday. Friday, okay. Okay, then that allows us to chase that up. Um, uh, Julie, when you t said about the taxi operators and you listed the kind of support that they could access, rate relief and so on and so forth, so forth we also know that the bus operators and wet pubs, as they're called, I don't like that term, uh, traditional pubs, others, um, could all access that kind of support and yet there was specific financial support put in place. Why did your department differentiate between bus operators and taxi operators? Um, the evidence, like obviously we engaged with both <coughs> sectors in September, um, and the evidence we had around that was that um, the ability of the coach operators in particular to access the existing support grants had been very, very limited. Um, and their model of operation was different in the sense that the insurance and maintenance costs which are all taken care of through the taxi drivers rather than the operators was obviously going through the coach operators so the it was based on the evidence provided and the scale of what um support was already available and what had been happening within the two sectors chair i just find going into a business model um to make that kind of an assessment has made this process quite bureaucratic and has resulted in the exclusion of the uh, of the taxi operators giving that if you went in to interrogate it or a business model further you would know that the taxi drivers their supply chain had been cut off we were advising people to stay at home so the people that they depend on to get into their taxis did not exist so that the taxis would not have been running in the same way I just don't, um, I don't understand, Julie, the rationale for when you look at the bus operators and the taxi operators, how you couldn't have arrived at the same conclusion that both of them were being severely impacted by this pandemic. Certainly, we, we looked at the evidence, uh, as I've already said, at, at the time and, and the level of support uh, that the coach and bus operators were able to access um, was very, very low. Um, they also, not only were they impacted then by the first three months of the pandemic, but a lot of their business completely, completely fell away. Um, whereas... Um, the thing for, the bus, for the bus operators, because their businesses, like taxis, we all know that some of the reasons why the taxi drivers had temporarily suspended their insurance, it was because it, you know, obviously they did not have anyone coming into their cars, so they didn't have anyone because we were asking people, just as we are doing now, to stay at home. So if you want to stay at home message and the curfew and every other you know, restriction that has been put in place, then you wouldn't be suggesting that there would be some kind of activity going on and that would allow the taxi operators uh, to continue because they were severely impacted by these restrictions. And, and I get part of that then is around they are then able to access part B around the restrictions, recognising, as you say, that their businesses have suffered decline and they are dependent on those businesses being open. And that's when part B was widened to uncover that, uh, so I guess, the supply chain type issues and the dependency issues that allows the taxi operators to apply. And we, on the discussions on Monday, it would appear that they either weren't aware of that or had not done so. So um, that's something that needs to be taken back to the operators themselves. Okay, well, I had a discussion with some of the operators after the meeting Monday, and that wasn't where they were coming at this from, that there was a realisation that there was support there that they didn't receive. I think there was just, um, they were quite disappointed that, um, that given the regulations for the industry um, is in the remit of, of, of your department, then they believe that your department should be the department that's ensuring that they get the financial support. Can I ask you, Julie, of the 400, you say 4,582 applicants, and then you repeated maybe that that might be the number of applicants coming forward. Just in a rough uh, calculation here, if 895 of them are duplicants, 
And I would suggest, based on what was coming into my um, office, that quite a number of those drivers were quite frustrated, Julie, because they were not, there was a communication issue. And they were sending in their emails, they weren't hearing back, they weren't sure if it was being processed. And I would suggest that perhaps that's why a number of people had applied again and applied again. It was born out of that frustration. But if you were to um, remove that from your 4,582 and then your 772 that didn't live in the north, what you're talking about is 2,915? No, no, no. The 4,582 mm -hmm. is after we've taken the duplicates and the other after jurisdiction, taken away, after we've taken okay. them away. Okay. So um, the 4,582 and... plus the 1,669? Was the original? Yes. Was the original? Okay. And then out of the 4,582, 20% or 13% of those were taxi drivers who had sus temporarily suspended their insurance? Yes, or have had some issue or other with their application, yes. Julie, if you're going to have to go into every single individual circumstances, um, like for instance, when we look at the localised restriction support scheme, and if everyone who had their business impacted that were entitled to that support, but they then try to calculate how many times someone came in their door or they try to delve down further because I'm concerned of every 30 days you're going to lose, for some of them, £250. What happens if, for instance, as we know, it's been given evidence in front of the committee that there was, for instance, one taxi driver, as we know, there was a four-day suspension, uh, someone who had been receiving cancer treatment. And by the time that they actually got their taxi renewed, there was a four-day gap. Do they lose the 30 days? Do they lose the 250? Yeah, we, we have proposed the 250 for 30 days as a a means of getting greater fairness into the system and to ensure that we are encompassing more drivers than we did the last time and to, to ensure that people don't lose out fully because of the fact, which is the case for the first scheme, if you weren't there for the four days or didn't have insurance for the four days, you would have lost that entire money. So by looking at it on a, on a, on a 30 days block, we're trying to, it's a bit like if you were your vehicle tax or whatever, it's the same sort of idea whereby if you, you, you go into a second month, you will potentially not be able to get a refund on your vehicle tax. It works in 30 day blocks. We believe that that's something that um, gives flexibility to people's circumstances. It's not down to the, you know, for every single day, we're going to give a particular payment out. But on 30 day blocks, we believe that that is a, a manageable uh, way of dealing with the issue and a fair way of dealing with the issue and that if we what because we as i say we looked at monthly and we decided that that wouldn't work because it doesn't give enough flexibility so on 30-day blocks we believe we can bring that fairness into it in a much more refined way than we had the first time um chair i just want to make the point uh, I, I don't believe that um the taxi drivers who had to temporarily suspend their insurance uh, should be what some of them will feel penalised as a consequence of doing that, given that the executive, and we all supported this, were telling people to stay at home and not take taxis, not to go out, and then as a consequence of that, they had no work. I really think that the 13% that we're talking about is going to create additional pressure um, on them personally and I think for ourselves uh, we will have those taxi drivers feeling somewhat disheartened and disappointed at the scheme that is being attempted to be put in place. Can I say to Julie I have been in touch with the Minister's office and one of her officials on, on a regular basis. I have been in touch with, uh, with them about 50 taxi drivers and the taxi drivers are coming to myself, like they're coming to other um, MLAs, and they haven't heard any notification back. Now, I'm telling them again 
that there will be a payment run this week. I have been told that. Can you confirm that there will be a payment run this week? And can you confirm that the end of this week that all of the taxi drivers um, that have applied that are eligible for the scheme, the first scheme at least, all of those will have received payment by the end of the week. So I'll maybe bring Beverly into this, but um, absolutely there's a payment run going out today, which we would expect to deal with um, the, the all those that are still eligible for payment um, to add obviously to those that have already got. Um, and that, that um, when combined with those then that have not been successful because they didn't have a full continuous insurance, that those, those people will also be notified and then advised that hopefully a second scheme is, is coming as well. Beverly, is there anything you want to add to that? Or no, no that that's right? fine. By the end of the week, um, we would expect the thing to be wrapped up. Okay, so we can, we as, as committee members and other MLAs who will be interested in this, Beverly, we can assure taxi drivers that there will be a payment run this week because many of yes. them are coming to us for some, and I would say to you, Beverly, um, if we're going into the next scheme, the one thing, maybe it's with the um, the phone calls or the phone number that you that you said would be in place. There needs to be some kind of communication with these taxi drivers because part of the frustration, and unfortunately no one should be getting abused, obviously, we all concur with that. Part of the frustration is they're not hearing back and they had been dependent on receiving this before Christmas. Yeah, Martina, that's fine. Completely accept the, the point about, about communications. One thing I would say just uh, in terms of whenever you did apply and you got your um, your ID reference number and then um, you were asked to upload to the uh, mailbox your insurance details, you got an acknowledgement then. So um, that acknowledgement, I would have hoped, would have indicated that your um, application was being looked at but obviously as we've talked about it's the scale and the volume of not just applications but emails so um we, we take the point that in going forward um communications we can we can tighten those up and and make it life a bit easier uh for for both ourselves and applicants as well yeah beverly i think once taxi drivers got an acknowledgement and i think from your end you probably assumed that they would have known that was in the system and being dealt with because of the weeks and weeks went by and they had all hoped they were going to receive this before Christmas. Um, at this stage now, um, many of them are apoplexic with worry and it is impacting on not just their mental health, but even their families, their livelihoods, everything else. And they're totally disheartened with the scheme at this point in time. So I'm glad to be able to report back to them that at least today there will be a payment run and the aim is by the end of this week that those yeah. drivers that were eligible, I would argue that all of them should have been eligible, if not, even if they had a good break, but that they would at least have their fund in place, their grant in place by the end of this week. Yeah. So thank you for that. Okay. Martina, just sorry, just on, on the point, just, just to clarify, obviously Julie has mentioned the, the three and a half thousand payments that were made before Christmas, and that's where um, we didn't have to go back to applicants seeking further information. And just just for just for uh, the committee's uh, members' information, just to, to clarify that in, on this occasion, I completely accept the point about people being uh, frustrated uh, that they're only getting the payment now when others got theirs uh, before Christmas, but just to illustrate um, some of the examples of, of, of why that happened, uh, where people did provide the additional information. They maybe um, typed in uh, the incorrect um, application reference, their ID reference number, or some people, um, and I think that's been the case for some of the ones you've sent in, uh, Martina, where they're known, um, they've maybe, they're known by a different name and they've put the name they're known by in the email, but on their application form, uh, they've put their full name, uh, but they maybe go by their second name, or they've maybe just typed in reference numbers incorrectly. Um, and then also, as Julie pointed out, we did have to check, um, do a 100% check on, on four and a half odd thousand um, insurance documents. So um, uh, some individuals didn't provide the correct insurance documentation. So we've had to go back maybe two or three times to some individuals. I appreciate that's been frustrating, but obviously just to ensure um, you know, they met the eligibility criteria and we had the right evidence, we've just had to go back and that process has taken time. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, and Ms Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Julie and Beverly. And I'm, I'm not going to labour on this, I think, because most of the questions have been asked. Just to be clear, the, the 25 million um, that, that um, the Minister received, is that now fully um, spent it, with the revised scheme? I think there was around 6 million left, and I know you said, Julie, that the revised scheme will, will take us up to about 10 million. So. Am I right in thinking there's about two left? Okay, I'll just maybe just go through the, the figures for you. So um, we've only we've got 19 million to the department already, and the other six million, making it to the 25, is still being held at the centre and has not been allocated yet to the department. Okay, so that's point number one. On the um, monies on the existing scheme, it's costing six million. Our estimate for the new scheme is a further 10 million, so it will be 16 million in total across the two ta taxi schemes. And then the balance is obviously then we had the 5 million estimate on the coach, the coach scheme, um, and that, that 16 plus the 5 gets you to 21, and that leaves there's another then 4 million potentially uh, if we call down the whole of the 25. So that's, that's where the numbers sit at this point. Just for my mind, because I'm <laughs> sorry. It's a, the six million still se separate. Six million is still that. sitting okay. separate. We have only got 19, which is why I think when Linda was here, she was talking to you about 19 million. Yeah. Uh, because that's the only actual money that has been allocated to the department at, at this point. Okay. And the other six million is sitting in DOF books. Um, but it's, it's been held centrally for transport. Yes. yes. And is there any reason why we're not? to get that or you well, know because obviously that... com coming back through on on this scheme we will we will we will definitely need access to some of that potentially up to the full 25 depending okay. where we go but we definitely will need access to some of that minister i'm sure will be discussing that with executive colleagues okay no that's fair enough the only other question was just so obviously we're going to have probably new applications for the taxi scheme yes because of, of the people who now qualify with the uh, insurance breaks those who've, who have been successful, will they get the second payment automatically or do they have to reapply? They have to, I think as we answer Mr McKenna, they have to right. reapply right. because we don't know anything about their insurance from October through to March, based okay. on the information they gave us beforehand. Well, we might, uh, but it depends on when you renewed your insurance. Okay. So it's, it'll be easier just to ask them to reapply. So, if, and apologies then if I've missed this because I've, there's not much going on here, but um, the final question then is, those, those taxi drivers who were ineligible for the first scheme because of the insurance, who now will be looking to backdate it, you know, to that, to, will they be prioritised? Because I think the fact that they've got nothing. Mm. Uh, well, I, I hesitate to say we'll be able to do that, to be honest, because I'm, I'm just thinking, we... I, we will be looking to see what we can do to automate as much as possible, I think is the fairest way of answering mm -hmm. that. We'll be looking with the sector about how to make it as easy as possible from a driver's point of view. To be able to pull them out is actually quite challenging. We find that quite challenging as everybody has asked us about what about and um, how has somebody's individual application been done. You actually end up spending more time doing that than you could maybe have done in, in processing, you know, a batch of payments. So I hesitate to say that we could prioritise because I suspect it will mean we'll end up going slower overall. The priority, I think, will be to get as many payments out as quickly as possible, and that we um, we do that as smoothly and as fast as we possibly can. But they they can apply for the full twelve months in one go. Yes, they can. So they're not. There's no. Yes. Two, okay. Yeah. No, but I think I suppose that that is. I know. I know. I know. There's challenges with that, all of this, but if we can get that information to people so they know what to expect. Um, I think that will be half the battle because obviously, as as Martina and others have, have alluded to there, sometimes the communication and, and people, I would imagine, and I know taxi drivers have contacted me, have probably applied twice because they thought, well, we're not getting any word back on my application, maybe something's wrong, I'll stick another one in. Yeah. And I know because in, in other departments, maybe where there's been an issue or an error or something, they've had to reapply and they're probably getting that feedback too. So if we can get as much of that information out, even through ourselves and the committee as well, I think that will be... A and, bit and that fun. applies to like the, the, the self-employment income support, the SAS scheme. I mean, you have to reapply for that. You have to, you know, so it's making sure that people know that those schemes are there. As yeah. You're absolutely right. And that they know that they can apply for them and, and they've kept running the whole way through. I think it's really important that we... Yeah. And that, I think, applies... I, I guess executive why doesn't it in terms of ensuring that people know all the schemes that are out there. Okay, no, thank one, you. One driver applied four times. Cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely wasn't taking a chance. Yeah. Julie, can I just ask how many staff are, are, are processing the applications? 
Um, we, well, Beverly can probably answer that easier. Go ahead, Beverly. Um, at, at the minute, um, Chair, um, and, and throughout the period, there's been um, 18 staff um, uh, on our, our side, on the on the policy side, and also um, the DBA side. So 18 staff in total have been uh, working on this uh, since this, this game closed on the 27th of November. Which is a considerable resource from a, a department that does not do policy, or sorry, grant making. Um, you know, it's we don't have that level of resource. We've had to pull people from quite a different areas of the department in in order to process it, and we will do that again to do the second scheme. Okay, thank you, um, Mrs. Kelly. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I, I think the issue of communication is one of the most important ones. So. Uh, can I just confirm that in relation to the uh, taxi operator scheme, that they um, would they have been would they be eligible for the you know the the first payments that were made the ten or twenty five thousand on the rateable value would they have been a, would they have been eligible for that? Um, yes, they were. Um, we know from the returns that were given to us that um, they accessed the ten k and indeed one of them accessed the twenty five k scheme as well. And I, I, just on your last point there, Julie, I do pick, uh, understand that this was a unique um, a piece of work and set of circumstances, I think, for your department. It's not normally engaged in uh, this sort of grant process. And I think so uh, uh, well done to you and your team for responding so quickly. Uh, I take it that uh, the issue around not being able to pay the insurance is one of financial property where the insurance hadn't been incurred as a cost. Uh, which audit wouldn't have stood over if, if any other um, uh, divergence had been taken by the minister or yourselves? Yes, it, it's the mechanism that assures the value for money and the good use of, of public funds that we can evidence that expenditure was incurred and it's off the back of that evidence that we can make the payments so it secures the value for money. Um, and very, very, very much that's the, that's the reason for it, yeah. And, and uh, will information, you know, the... The members are right to say that there's so much information going out and so many grants and people are responding to emergencies or to gaps, you know, that some people dropped off the, the scale because it just it hadn't been seen. Uh, so in terms of um, uh, pulling it together, uh, like uh, that the taxi drivers, for example, they can apply to the Department of Infrastructure for their overhead cost of the grant of 1500 and they can also apply to the income support uh, scheme to the Department of the Economy. And, and will that information be um, put out jointly by both departments so that, you know, people are informed uh, at their earliest opportunity? Um, I think so. The income support scheme is run by HMRC. So it's a bit like furlough. It comes from mm -hmm. the, the UK government. Um, so uh, when you look at... When you look at websites, there's a, the, the MI Business Info website is, is probably the most comprehensive that, that covers off a, um, a lot of the schemes, whether they relate to individuals or whether they, they relate to businesses. But it does take effort and time to go down those and to make a, a distinction between what can, what can I apply for and what can I not apply for. So we appreciate that the part of this is about getting awareness out there. Um, and ensuring that people are aware and that there is support available to them, we want them to apply. You know that's what the scheme is there for. So, absolutely encouraging awareness, and I guess the the executive working as a whole around that because um, the schemes are supporting each other, and and that's um, it's making sure that everybody gets everything that they should be able to access and that they know about it and that they're not missing an opportunity that, that might be out there for them. But it is very complex and, and in, in the number, if you just look at the number of schemes, it's, it's huge. Uh, yeah, because, uh, sorry, we've got, uh, you're right, the HMRC, you're right to correct me on that. I, I know that the other uh, scheme um, was the second one, the Department of Economy Part B. Uh, I'm not sure whether taxi drivers have been able to access that or not. But can I ask, has there been any engagement with the professional body uh, such as accountants? Because I have spoken to a number of accountants and they actually are assisting and all businesses really with, uh, with access to access a number of schemes so just wonder is there any engagement uh, with the representative body there we've been working with accountants on the on the coach scheme because their scheme does require a, 
an awful lot more kind of um, business related data, I guess. Uh, the taxi drivers hasn't required that because it is only really dependent on, on that insurance information. To answer your question, the Part B um, is not accessible to taxi drivers. Um, Minister had wanted it to be, but they are specifically excluded. So only taxi operators can 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 access Part B. Um, but we we will obviously we, we definitely are working with accountants where we need them and where they are required, and that's definitely in play on on the coach and bus operators. We're in contact with uh, accountants on a regular basis on that scheme. Thanks very much, Judy. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else wish to ask anything further at this stage? No? Can I um, thank both yourself, Julie uh, and Beverly, for coming this morning? And actually, it's quite nice to have some sort of advanced knowledge of some of these things now. Obviously, we're, we're ahead of the game with regards to even the executive having the discussion. So hopefully that will um, go as planned. Um, and obviously, there are still, uh, as members have highlighted, there are still some issues in and around the scheme, which will, will probably become more evident as we as we work through that. But um, again, can can I thank both, both of you for attending, and um, and also to pass on our thanks to, to staff who are working through this um, at what well, is a very challenging time for everybody. Thank you very much. I'm sure Beverly thank will you. pass that on to the team. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, Draw your attention then to the forward work program item 13 at page 356. That's for the next number of weeks. If you're content with that, um, do members have any other business they wish to raise at this point? Although we have covered quite a bit throughout the meeting, we are well over our time. By the way, um, we should have been out of here by 12 o'clock, but um, there was no one rushing to get in, so um, allow some flexibility. Um, just as you're leaving, just. Uh, be mindful of social distancing and take all your papers and, um, and so on with you. Um, next week's meeting will take place at 10am in our usual location of the Senate Chamber, so that will be Wednesday 20 January at 10am. And we will be receiving a briefing from DVA officials. And as yet, and not yet confirmed, what has now been organised anyway. um, for Nilga and Solas. And if there's anything additional, we will, um, we will let members know. Chair, sorry. Oh, she's away. Well, no, we're not oh, we're quite here. away. We're, here. we're still oh, here. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Uh, it was just one matter I should have indicated earlier under AOB, and I'm just wondering, I understand the Minister met with the um, Into the West group. It's called earlier this month, uh, who wished for the extension of the rail network among other things, and I was uh, going to ask Cathy through yourself if we could write to the Minister asking for an update on the Department's action regarding the rail extension and engaging uh, with her counterparts in the, in the South. Please. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. No problem. The, the meeting's now adjourned. Thank you. 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.